Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. The Committee meets today to consider reporting a resolution to the House of Representatives finding the Attorney General Eric Holder, Jr. in contempt of Congress. On the night of December 14, 2010, in a canyon west of Rio Rico, Arizona, U.S. Border Patrol agent, agents were engaged in a shootout with armed Mexican bandits preying on illegal immigrants. One of the agents was 40-year-old Brian Terry, a three-year veteran who had served as a U.S. Marine and gone through boot camp at Camp Pendleton in my district. During that firefight, a, bill, a bullet pierced Agent Terry's aorta, and he died in that canyon. Two weapons were found at the scene. They were later traced to an operation conducted by the Department of Justice called Fast and Furious. Sixteen months ago, this committee, along with Senator Chuck Grassley, launched an investigation into whistleblowers' allegations regarding Fast and Furious. We became, in, became involved only after Senator Grassley was told he would not receive answers from the Justice Department because, in fact, he did not have subpoena power and was not the chairman. In the course of our investigation, the committee has uncovered serious wrongdoing by the Justice Department. That wrongdoing led to 2,000 weapons crossing the Mexican border that cost lives on both sides of the border, including Brian Terry's. A year and a half later, the Terry family is still searching for answers. The operation contributed to the deaths of countless Mexican citizens. It has soured our relationship with our neighbor to the south. It has created an ongoing safety problem here in the United States in which even the Attorney General has admitted more lives could be lost. The Department of Justice has fought this committee's investigation every step of the way, starting with an unequivocal denial that it used the reckless tactics we now know were used in Fast and Furious. The denial proved to be false and ultimately the Justice Department withdraw, withdrew it. They withdrew it in December, having given it to us in February. Today's contempt is in no small part because the materials between the time a false statement was given to us in writing and later affirmed in sworn testimony by the Justice Department's representative, an officer of the court, a lawyer, and now the dean of a law school was ultimately false, that intervening period remains one of the areas of investigation. It is clear that Congress relies on its ability to get truthful testimony when investigating wrongdoing in and around the executive branch. In spite of this lack of transparency, the committee has managed to piece together much of what happened, and we believe we can help participate in making sure it never happens again. But our work is not complete, and we need the Department of Justice to cooperate. Thus far, the cooperation has not been forthcoming. Over and over again, the Department has sought to protect its political appointees. It has used this investigation by the, its investigation by the Department's Inspector General, which has been pending a very long time as a reason not to cooperate. We are now on the second Inspector General. There has been no interim report, and although they say it will be forthcoming within a month, we and the American people need answers sooner, not later. The Attorney General has, in fact, said he has gone to extraordinary measures to participate and to help. We have received to date approximately 7,600 documents. A great many of those documents are, in fact, responsive to other operations conducted before he was Attorney General. And those documents pale in comparison to the 80,000 documents or more that the Inspector General has received. Our purpose has never been to hold the Attorney General in contempt. 
our purpose has always been to get the information the committee needs to complete its work that it is not only entitled to but obligated to do we had offered the department an accommodation to address its concerns about information related to ongoing prosecutions if the justice department had delivered the documents they freely admitted admitted they could deliver we wouldn't be here today as late as last night in discussions with the attorney general our offer his offer was only to give us a briefing and such documents as supported the briefing and then only if we ended the investigation. Contempt today is not about whether we end the investigation or not. It is about a narrow subset of the documents that the committee must ultimately receive. The subpoenas are eight months old. We have not received a credible uh, reason for them not being supplied. And in, and, in fact, no constitutional assertion has occurred. Rather, it is the duty of the executive branch and its agencies to re re represent itself honestly before Congress and to make available such transparency as necessary for us to fund and authorize, it now and in the future, the request of this and future Presidents. Only today, only a few minutes before the gaveling of this, uh, uh, this uh, markup, did we receive from the Deputy Attorney General a letter dated today, not talk, spoken of last night, which says, and I would ask unanimous consent the entire letter be placed in the record without objection so ordered. In the first paragraph, it says, I write, to I write now to inform you that the President has asserted executive privilege over relevant post-February 4, 2011 documents. It goes on for several pages. As we speak, as I speak, the committee is evaluating this. We have verified that no communication from the President has arrived before the House. Additionally, at least in a preliminary evaluation, we discover that the President, well after February 4th, has said that, in fact, he has not discussed this and was not made aware of it. Additionally, the, uh, the Attorney General has repeatedly uh, given us testimony showing that he did not speak to the President about this. I now read for the record from page 25 of When Congress Comes Calling, which is from the Constitution Project. And I apologize if this seems preliminary, but this communication arrived only within minutes of the start of this markup. Executive privilege. The President's communications privilege, and I quote, the communications in question must relate to the quintessential and non-delegatable presidential power that requires direct presidential decision making. The privilege is limited to the core constitutional powers of the President, such as the power to appoint and remove, the commander-in-chief power the sole authority to receive ambassadors and public ministers and the pardoning power. I claim not to be a constitutional scholar, but the House is currently working to find out what assertions may in fact arrive and we will take notice of them. Having said that, more than eight months after a subpoena and clearly after the question of executive privilege could have and should have been asserted, this untimely assertion by the uh, Justice Department falls short of any reason to delay today's proceedings. We have made many attempts to accommodate the Justice Department. Originally, some 22 areas were on our subpoena many of which were never complied with. We narrowed three master areas to two in a letter on May 18th, 
unprecedented letter from the Speaker of the House asking for cooperation and narrowing the scope of the subpoena. Since that time, we have further narrowed to one area uh, for purposes of contempt, and we have been denied. The Attorney, the Attorney General has refused to co cooperate, offering to provide subpoena documents only if the committee agrees in advance to close the investigation. No investigator would ever agree to that. And as you could understand, the other information related to those in the chain of command responsible for Brian Terry's murder and the death of individuals both north and south of the border cannot be concluded simply based on a briefing about post-February 4th. The Attorney General says that his offer is extraordinary. The only thing extraordinary about his offer is that he is asking the committee to close an investigation before the committee even gets to see the documents. He is pretending to, he is pretending, uh, to offer. I can't accept that deal. No other committee chairman would. This committee will be considering uh, today a very narrow contempt, but members on both sides of the dais have repeatedly said that we owe it to the Terry family to get to the truth. It is my intention to continue post-contempt to do our job while meeting our other obligations to pursue waste, fraud, and abuse in our government. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, it is, um, I just want to, first of all, go back for one moment and the document that you read from June 20th, 2012, the one that you and I just got from James Cole, Deputy Attorney General. I just want to just, since we were talking about executive privilege, and I do believe that we need to study this and um, make sure that we understand exactly what uh, the President is asserting here, but just want to quote from it. Um, and it, uh, on page, the last page, page 4, it says, The legal basis for the President's assertion of executive privilege is set forth in the enclosed letter to the President from Attorney General. In brief, the compelled production to Congress of these internal executive branch documents generated in the course of the deliberative process concerning the Department's response to congressional oversight and related media inquiries would have significant damaging consequences. As I explained at our meeting yesterday, and this is still quoting from the letter, it would inhibit the candor of such executive branch deliberations in the future and significantly impair the executive branch's ability to respond independently and effectively to congressional oversight. Such compelled disclosure would be inconsistent with the separation of powers established in the Constitution and would potentially create an imbalance in the relationship between these two co-equal branches of government. And now to, to, to my statement, um, first and foremost, I believe that Congress does, in fact, and we will agree on this, Mr. Chairman, has a responsibility to conduct vigorous oversight of the executive branch. That is our job. The Constitution requires this from Congress, and the American people expect it from members who serve on this committee, and I take that very seriously. But the Constitution also requires something else. It requires us to recognize the legitimate interests of the executive branch and to avoid unnecessary conflict by seeking reasonable accommodations when possible. In my opinion, the committee has failed in this fundamental responsibility. Last night, the Attorney General came to us in good faith. He offered to provide additional internal deliberative documents. He pledged to provide a su substantive briefing on the Department's actions. He agreed to a request by Senator Grassley to describe the categories of documents being produced and those being withheld. He made clear that he was willing to provide 
substantive responses to additional questions. And he even offered to provide documents that are outside the scope of the Committee's subpoena. And he also made it clear that he had already provided documents that weren't even asked for. All he requested in return was that you, as Chairman of this Committee, give him your good faith commitment that we would move toward resolving this contempt fight. Didn't ask for ending the investigation, just ending this contempt fight. And I double checked with my staff because I, I, when you said that, I, 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 I heard, I was in the meeting with him and I heard what he said, he was very clear. It was a, a fair and reasonable offer, in special, in, in, especially in the light of the partisan and highly inflammatory personal attacks you made against him throughout this investigation. For the past year, you have been holding the Attorney General to an impossible standard. You accuse him of a cover-up, and I quote, that is a quote, for t protecting documents he was pro prohibited by law from producing. Let me say that again. You accuse him of a cover-up for protecting documents that he was prohibited by law from producing. You claim that he, and I quote, obstructed, end of quote, the Committee's work by complying with Federal statutes passed by both Houses of Congress and signed by the President of the United States. And earlier this month, you went on national television and called the Attorney General the Nation's highest ranking chief law enforcement officer a liar. At the same time, you refused request to hold a public hearing with Ken Melson, the former head of ATF, the agency responsible for conducting these operations. This refusal came after Mr. Melson told the committee investigators privately that he never informed senior officials at the Justice Department about gun walking during Operation Fast and Furious because he was unaware himself. Last night, you flatly rejected the Attorney General's offer. You refused to even commit to working towards a mutually, mutually agreeable resolution. Instead, you rushed to a prearranged press conference to announce the failure of the meeting. It seems clear that you had no interest in resolving this issue and that the Committee planned to go forward with contempt before we walked into the meeting with the Attorney General. It pains me to say this, but this is what I believe. This is especially disappointing since the Department has already turned over more than 1,000 pages of documents that answer your question. You want to know why the Department sent a letter to Senator Grassley initially denying allegations of gun walking. The documents show that when they were drafting this letter, the Department's Legislative Affairs Office relied on the categorical and emphatic denials from the leaders of ATF. These are the same ATF officials you now refuse to call for a public hearing. This morning, we were informed that the Administration is now asserting executive privilege over, and you are right, a narrow subset, and it is indeed narrow, of documents that remain at issue. As I understand it, the assertion does not cover everything in this category, such as whistleblower documents. And the Administration has indicated that it remains, and I emphasize remains, willing to try to come to a mutual resolution despite its formal legal assertion. As a member of Congress, I treat assertions of executive privilege very seriously, and I believe they should be used only sparingly. In this case, it seems clear that the Administration was forced into a position by the Committee's unreasonable insistence on pressing forward with contempt despite the Attorney General's good faith offer. Mr. Chairman, it did not have to be this way. It really didn't. We could have postponed today's vote, accepted the Attorney General's offer, and worked with the Department to obtain additional documents and information. Instead, by not honoring the Constitution's charge to seek accommodation when possible, the position and prestige of this Committee has been 
diminished and the result should concern us all. With that, I yield back. I trust the gentleman did not mean to demean my intention, but for the record, uh, the press conference that occurred after our meeting was equally usable and intended to announce that we had a deal and a stay if it was appropriate. And uh, I had prepared a written statement saying that we would be staying uh, today's uh, markup had we been offered anything pursuant to our letters. So I trust the gentleman would realize that uh, it could I, have gone another way and we had no idea. I, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, I believe you when you say that. I trust that that's what the uh, situation was. I simply was giving my opinion of the way it was set up. That's all. I thank the gentleman. I will hold the record open until the end of the day for members who would like to submit formal written statements. The report uh, will be considered as read under regular order, and members will be recognized to speak to offer amendments under the five-minute rule. I now call up the contempt report regarding Attorney General Eric Holder. The report has been distributed to all members. Without objection, the report will be considered as read and open for amendment at any time. Does anyone wish to speak on the report? With that, I would recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Five minutes. Well, first of all, uh, let me just say, after having been chairman of this committee for six years, I want to compliment our chairman on being so patient. I mean, if anybody looks at the record and sees how long Darrell Issa has dealt with this issue and how he's handled it, I think they would say that he has been more than patient. And so I think that needs to be in the record. The second thing I'd like to say is that there's no question in anybody's mind that's been involved in this investigation that the, the Attorney General has been stonewalling this committee. The Chairman has contacted him and his associates numerous times and uh, without result. And when the chairman met with him uh, the la in the last 24 hours and, and discussed this, there was no information forthcoming that would have been able to uh, uh, set aside this uh, contempt hearing today. The second thing I'd like to say is that the president's assertion of executive privilege creates even more questions. One of the big issues that uh, we've been dealing with is who knew about Fast and Furious, when did they know about it, and how high up did it go? And the, the Attorney General has asserted on numerous occasions that he didn't know about this. Now the President of the United States has claimed executive privilege. That brings into question whether or not Eric Holder knew about it, and how much did the President know about this? Why would the President claim executive privilege unless there was something very, very important that he felt should not be made known to this committee and possibly to the public. And so my question is, and I'm not going to take uh, all my time, who knew about this? How high up did it go? Did it go to the Attorney General or even the President of the United States? And when did they know it? And this committee needs to find that out, especially since we had not only weapons going across the border, but a Border Patrol agent murdered with those weapons. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentlelady from New York is recognized for five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I am astounded that today we are sitting here weighing whether to hold the Attorney General of the United States the highest ranking law enforcement officer in our country in contempt of Congress. The House of Representatives has never in our long history held an attorney general in contempt. And I am horrified that you are going forward with this contempt charge when the President of the United States his, and the administration have in, invoked executive privilege for the documents sought by the chairman. And the attorney general is being attacked for protecting documents that he is prohibited by law from producing. And uh, I just speak strongly in opposition to this action 
and in opposition to this report. I, I would like to point out that our committee, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, is supposed to root out problems and find ways to reform how government works. It shouldn't be a political witch hunt against the Attorney General of our country and our President in an election year. And what we should be doing is looking at ways we can stop problems from happening again. So my basic question, Mr. Chairman, is where is the reform? Our committee is supposed to be working on government reform. And any legitimate investigation must be rooted in finding solutions to problems once they're identified, not just character assassination and overruling presidents and attacking the chief law enforcement officer in our land. So again, I ask, where are the reforms? During this investigation, we've learned a great deal about what went wrong in the Phoenix Field Division at the ATF and the Arizona United States Attorney's Office. We heard directly from ATF agents who witnessed the misguided tactics of gun walking occur, which started in prior administrations. And they asked for our help in implementing reforms and coming forward with solutions to the problems that they were seeing every day along the southwest border. The problem they were worried about was not paperwork and subpoenas and contempt charges. They were worried about guns. So where are the reforms and the actions that we could take in response to the problems that they put before us? Throughout this investigation, ATF witnesses consistently told this committee that they need reinforcements to the weak federal laws that prohibit gun trafficking. Peter Forselli, an ATF special agent in Phoenix, called existing gun laws toothless. So, Mr. Chairman, when do we put forward some teeth in the law to help our enforcement officers combat crime. Efforts to simply discuss reforms have not been welcomed by this committee. When I attempted to question the ATF agents about defects with the current laws to combat gun trafficking, uh, Mr. Chairman, you cut me off and specifically instructed the ATF agents not to answer my question. So I tried to act on reforms with many members of this committee, including Ranking Member Cummings. We tried to help law enforcement officers fight gun trafficking along the southwest border. And we did not get any support from the other side of the, of the aisle. And Mr. Issa has rebuffed uh, requests by Ranking Member Cummings to address reforms at the Department of Justice and the clear need for legislation to fight illegal gun trafficking along the southwest border, including a request for a hearing on the topic. Just a hearing. And the chairman has also demanded that the Department of Justice produce a wiretap applications that were ordered sealed. General Lady's time has expired. I ask the unanimous consent that General Lady have an additional 30 seconds without objection, so ordered. And I, I must say, Mr. Chairman, I, I am offended uh, personally uh, by your calling the Attorney General a liar. And uh, it's extremely um, disrespectful and, and attacking to our uh, public servant. And you've called me a liar. You apologize later and I accept it. But where have we degenerated to in calling names not having hearings on meaningful reforms, not acting on reforms, but merely uh, degenerating uh, to uh, attacking people and, and uh, moving forward with paperwork that is unwarranted, unfair, and violates the law of the United States of America. I thank the gentlelady. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for upholding the responsibility of uh, this uh, investigative arm of the House of Representatives to uh, hold uh, the highest ranking prosecutorial official in the United States uh, and the United States uh, government responsible uh, for what uh, turned into a uh, horrible death of one of our agents and a, a, a plan that uh, went uh, dramatically sour. <clears throat> I chaired the Criminal Justice Drug Policy Subcommittee, uh, worked on Plan Colombia, <clears throat> met with the Mexican officials, warned them of what was coming. In March 2009, we had a hearing. Mr. Waxman was uh, the chairman at the time. Um, uh, this report says Congressman Micah reached out his hand to the new administration by pass passionately pledging his full support if the new administration allocates <clears throat> large resources to assist the Mexican government to contain drug violence with zero tolerance towards drug lords. Micah explicitly encouraged the administration to put in place a plan to stop the slaughterhouse south of the border and help Mexico rega regain control of its uh, country. Uh, I also criticized the previous uh, uh, Democrat-controlled Congress for not conducting a single hearing. I did dozens of them. Uh, General Lady is wrong in that uh, this is the first Attorney General uh, to uh, face this situation. Henry Waxman threatened and scheduled contempt proceedings against some of the Bush officials, including uh, McCloskey, the Attorney General. He charged him with failing to produce documents in connection <clears throat> with the committee's investigation and the re release of classified documents. This is not about release of classified documents. This is very serious business. This is the highest judicial prosecutorial position in the United States involved in creating a situation in which an agent of the United States was murdered with weapons supplied by the Department of Justice in a scheme that went uh, unbelievably sour, as I said. Now, for the first 11 months, the administration denied, they denied participation in this to this committee, the investigative arm of the House of Representatives. For eight months, the chairman has uh, we've had a subpoena out there, and they de denied providing us the information. At the, at the uh, last hour, last night, they offered uh, a deal to provide us some information and tried to close down the case. This is absolutely absurd. Then this morning, the White House, in an attempt to thwart the committee's lawful investigation tries to throw out ex executive privilege, a complete uh, fiasco. Mr. Burton and I, we've been on this committee a long time. There are reasons to exert executive privilege and, and to stop the, try to stop the investigation of this committee into the Department of Justice, bringing about one of the worst besmirchments on the history of the Department of Justice is indeed an injustice to the Congress, to the American people, and this important investigative arm of the House of Representatives. This is a very sad day for the United States of America when the President would engage himself at the last minute and try to exert executive privilege, when the Attorney General, who uh, again, uh, and, and you know, our, our job is to find out what went wrong. Maybe he, maybe he is innocent. Maybe people are innocent in this. But there is no reason in the world or under the law or under the proceedings of Congress and our Constitution, and the way this government is set up, that this committee is not entitled to this information in this investigation to again maintain the, the integrity of this important uh, office. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm idealistic. I just, I, I didn't think this could go on in a Department of Justice in the United States of America 
in this day and age. It is a very sad day. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, actually, I have a, uh, I have a question about the process that the gentlelady is recognized for a question. That, 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 that was undertaken um, within the last uh, 24 hours uh, in light of, of a statement you made. We are down, as I understand it, to internal deliberative documents, which may be the basis uh, for the executive privilege, and, and, and the committee is no longer uh, demanding documents that are under under seal or or uh, involved in ongoing investigations, criminal investigations. So we're down to the the internal uh, deliberative uh, correspondence uh, within the department, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, if we uh, are. Will the gentlelady state a question? Yes. Um, um, and this is the preface to the. Now, the gentlelady could be recognized for five minutes for any reason. Uh, well, but then it, maybe. Could you narrow your question? Well, then let me ask. Can I go on for five minutes then? The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it, so during this process, there has been a, uh, a, 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 a an attempted resolution. The concern that we learn. Uh, about uh, what caused uh, the killing of the agent was a bipartisan concern. Uh, in, in your opening remarks, you left the impression that the Attorney General came with certain offerings of documents and demanded not to be held in contempt. Uh, the ranking member, uh, says in his statement that the Attorney General uh, asked uh, that, and I am quoting now from what the ranking member sa said, that we move toward, toward resolving this contempt fight. Uh, you will forgive me, Mr. Chairman, if I read that as a, um, a call for continued discussions and negotiations. Uh, behind the contempt matter. Now, Mr. Chairman, considering that uh, no Cabinet official uh, has ever been held by uh, the courts to be in contempt of Congress, that uh, if this matter gets to the floor of the House, it would then be referred uh, to a Democratic uh, U.S. Attorney just as uh, to take the opposite case when this committee referred similar matters uh, to uh, ultimately a Republican uh, U.S. attorney, no action was taken. If we are interested in resolution, understanding that is the likely final result, it does seem to me, and I would ask you to reconsider what appears to be an offer by the Attorney General, uh, not uh, a demand, and I, did, I believe some clarification is necessary here, but an offer that if he presented these documents, which he believes he did not have to present, that you in turn agree to, to engage in continuing discussions uh, and negotiations. If that is the case, it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that would be the reasonable thing to do at this point, especially in light of the executive privilege that just been asserted. Would the gentlelady yield? Yes, sir. Um, as I said in the opening, we don't have an assertion of, a, of executive privilege at the House. We uh, executive privilege has to have specificity as to what is it being asserted over what documents. And normally, as you know, a privilege log goes with that. To date, the House has not received that from the Office of the President. So although I read the uh, portion of the letter and it, the entire letter is in the record, I did so uh, only so that we would take note that it may come and that we certainly may uh, uh, recess at some point to evaluate the actual statement Mr. from Chairman, the President. We are holding time right now, actually. Uh, we stop the clock because I, I want to make sure you have your full time. But if the general lady would allow me to continue, when it comes to the question of postponing today, had the Attorney General 
yesterday turned over the documents he said he would turn over in return for essentially an ending of this investigation. Had he turned over those documents, we would not be here today. We would be evaluating those documents. But until we evaluate documents that tell us that we can bring a close either to contempt or to the entire investigation, we can't assume that. And, of course, as you know, or hopefully the, the uh, ranking member would explain, there was no log or no actual documentation showing what they intended to present. So I did go into that meeting yesterday with full intent that we would likely postpone based on something being produced. Nothing was produced. And I'm still waiting. And I said in the news conference yesterday that I would wait all night. And we did have people here all night in hopes that those documents would arrive and that we would then postpone where we evaluated the documents. The general lady may resume. Mr. Chairman, assuming no executive privilege had been, um, had been invoked and that we had only the offer to give the documents, if, if the chairman would consider, after receiving the documents, uh, continued discussions and negotiations, wouldn't that have been the way to resolve this matter? If the general would further yield, yes, if, the, if we were being offered in return for a postponement documents, and then we could judge them, both the majority and minority, and then reenter negotiations as appropriate, we wouldn't be here today. Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I believe that, that in light of that, that some clarification on what the offer expected and what, in fact, uh, uh, occurred is in order rather than proceeding to the contempt vote. Uh, Would it generally yield? Um, yes, sir. If, and would the chairman give me just? A, I mean, since you were trying to explain that, may I have a little bit? May have a little bit more time? Stop. All right. The and I've said this before. The attorney general um, did not ask for the ending of the investigation. What he was trying to do, and he spent quite a bit of the little twenty minutes that we had together, saying that he had limited personnel, and his personnel were being tied up in going through these millions of emails uh, and documents and whatever. And he basically said at some point um, he just wanted to see if we could um, move towards bringing the contempt uh, situation uh, to a uh, conclusion or moving towards it. And that's what he, as I understand it, what he was asking for. Um, not, I mean, he understood well that the investigation was going to go on. Um, because we've got a lot to investigate, but uh, but he did not. He talked about the contempt, and that was my understanding. To generally, you can see, Mr. M Mr. Chairman, finally that there is a, a uh, dispute even on what went on in the room, and I think it merits a continuing continuing discussions with the Justice Department. Uh, if the gentlelady would further yield. Yes. I, I trust that the Justice Department is hearing my interpretation. If they want to deliver documents, they're, they're welcome to. Uh, but again. But of course, if the contempt is voted already, then of course we have, we have we've ended that possibility. Uh, and since the Justice Department is now hearing uh, a difference in between two people who are at the same meeting, it does seem to me that it calls for uh, some, uh, some uh, opportunity for the Justice Department to come forward and resolve that dispute between the two major figures who were in the deliberations. And I would ask that that be considered. I appreciate the gentlelady. If she'd further. Gentlelady, you. Thank you for yielding. I, I would be glad to yield. I just, just want to, just sort of going back to something you said. Um, in, in, the, in the document which was sent from the Attorney General's office this morning is now a part of the record, and I just want to read the last few words. It says, in closing, while we are deeply disappointed that the committee intends to move forward with consideration of a contempt citation, I stress that the Department remains willing to work towards a mutually satisfactory resolution of this matter. Uh, please do not hesitate to call and contact us. Thank you very much for yielding. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentlelady. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. What purpose does the gentleman from Utah seek recognition? I, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the beauty and miracle that is the United States of America is that there is no one person in this country that is above the law. 
And I believe this committee has a duty, obligation, and a right to investigate this matter to its fullest effect. In fact, I would hearken back to the words of President Obama on his first full day of office. I would like to read from that. Let me say as simply as I can, transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. I will also, be held, also hold myself as president to new standard of openness. He went on and said, but the mere fact that you have the legal power to keep something secret does not mean you should always use it. The Freedom of Information Act is perhaps the most powerful instrument we have for making our government honest and transparent and holding it accountable. And I expect members of my administration not simply to live up to the letter, but also the spirit of the law. The President then issued a, uh, a memorandum to the heads of the executive departments on January 1, 2009, quote, the government should not keep information confidential merely because public officials might be embarrassed by disclosure, because errors or failures might be revealed, or because of speculative or abstract fears, end quote. The President then, in, in March uh, of 2011, in talking about Fast and Furious, said there may be a situation here in which a serious mistake was made, and if that's the case, we'll find out and we'll hold somebody accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, that has not happened. On February 4th of last year, 2011, the Congress was sent a letter that was false. It took 10 months for that information to be provided, to be, to be withdrawn. The subpoena that we're talking about today was issued in October of last year, and now it's June 20th and the President is issuing is exerting executive privilege, and we haven't yet seen this? I'd like to enter to the record, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Uh, Chairman, to enter uh, a letter of, of June 3, 2011, signed by 31 Democrats sent to the President of the United States. Without objection, sir. I'm going to read from, thank you, Mr. Chairman, a couple of excerpts from this letter. Quote, it is equally troubling that the Department of Justice has delayed action and withheld information from congressional inquiries. End quote. Later, it said, again, a letter from 31 Democrats to the President, June 3, 2011, quote, while the Department of Justice can and should continue its investigation, those activities should not curtail the ability of Congress to fulfill its oversight duties, end quote. And last quote I'll take from that, we urge you to instruct the Department of Justice to promptly provide complete answers to all congressional inquiries on this issue, end quote. None of that has happened. It's sad. It's disappointing. It shouldn't have come to this. Nobody likes doing this. This is not about Eric Holder. It is about the Department of Justice and justice in the United States of America. Have the guts. I hope we have the guts and the perseverance to get to the bottom of this. We have two, nearly 2,000 weapons purposely, purposely given to drug cartels. We have hundreds of dead people in Mexico. We have a dead United States Border Patrol agent. And we have a government that's withholding information so that we can not only get to the bottom of it, but that we can fix it and make sure that it never, ever happens again. And when we're issued a letter, and 10 months later, they've got to pull it back and say, no, that's not true, something is fundamentally wrong. It's also not about 140,000 documents that the Department of Justice knowingly says that they have, and we have less than 8,000 of them. It's not about those numbers. It's the fact that we don't have all of them, whatever that number is. And when you have somebody like the, the former acting uh, uh, director of the ATF say, under oath, quote, it was very frustrating to all of us, and it appears thoroughly to us that the department is really trying to figure out a way to push the information away from their political appointees at the department. He was talking about the Department of Justice. Those are things that we should be concerned about. Nobody wants to put a conclusion to this more than Chairman Issa. I want to put a conclusion to this. Everybody on this panel should want to put a conclusion to this. Now, when these problems and challenges came up to, to the GSA, they dealt with them. Martha Johnson stepped down. When we had problems at the Secret Service, within days people had resigned and stepped down. But the reality is we have not gotten to the bottom of this. And Brian Terry was killed in December of 2010. We have a duty, an obligation, a moral obligation to get to the bottom of this. It's sad and it's disappointing, but the Department of Justice should provide us these documents. It's disappointing that we have to be here today. It's not about Eric Holder. It's about the Department of Justice and justice in the United States of America. That's why I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to show the guts needed to actually pass this and move it to the floor for further debate. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. We now recognize the gentleman from New York, the former chairman of the committee, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm troubled over how we are going about this. 
As a former chairman of this committee, I am deeply disturbed that this committee is continuing to pursue the unprecedented course of holding a sitting Attorney General in contempt of Congress. Mr. Chairman, you claim that contempt is warranted because Mr. Holder's office has refused to turn over documents that the majority asserts is critical to the investigation of gun walking operation along the Arizona-Mexico border. The majority claims are without merit. And let me say that I could see it was a situation where the Attorney General was not responding, but he's been up here nine times testifying. And let me just say one other thing, too, that in all of my 30 years of being in the United States Congress, the way that he was treated when he was here testifying before this committee, I must admit, I've never seen anybody treated in that fashion. So I don't understand why we have to move in this order if they're cooperating. If they're not cooperating, then I, maybe we could understand what you're doing. But I'll be honest with you, I think this is a mistake, a major mistake, and I really want you to know that I think that uh, this should be discontinued, and let's see if we can continue to get the information that he's willing to sit down and provide, and has indicated that. And I don't understand why we have to move in this fashion. Uh, it's a discredit to this committee, and of course, um, uh, this committee, as you know, has a full name of oversight and government reform. And I don't see you reforming anything here. I just don't get the point. It just does not make sense to me. And it's the most ridiculous thing that I think I've seen in my years of being on this committee. I yield to the gentlewoman from uh, New York. Balance my time. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. And I, I uh, would like to be associated with his comments and also those of Ms. Norton. Uh, the administration and, and the attorney general uh, have made an offer to continue discussions. And I, I believe these discussions should move forward in the spirit of, of getting some type of conclusion and the information that you need and solutions uh, moving forward. And I, I want to quote from the letter that uh, was sent to Mr. Issa from uh, James Cole. And in it he says, I, uh, I stress that the department remains willing to work toward a mutually satisfactory resolution of this matter. So why can't we work together? And I uh, would like to publicly thank Mr. Micah, Chairman Micah, really, for working across the aisle uh, on uh, the transportation bill. And hopefully this can move forward in a bipartisan way. And I think we should work across the aisle on uh, getting uh, this resolved in a way that uh, satisfies the chairman and the members on both sides of the aisle. And uh, the fact that he has made an offer to continue discussions, uh, we should uh, follow up. And I think that this offer reinforces the points that, uh, that uh, my good friend, uh, the Congressman Norton, was making, that the Justice Department is open to uh, working towards some type of conclusion. And I, I would like to say we have never censured a cabinet officer in, in the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. I think it was some people or, or had a contempt vote. I think there was one on some EPA officials that were lower down. I can't remember. You, you could probably remember. But never a cabinet officer and never the, the highest ranking uh, member of, of, of law enforcement for our country uh, who is willing to work with the chairman. Uh, so I, I feel that... Uh, this is an area that we could uh, work together in a positive way. And I yield back to the gentleman from the great state of New York, my good friend, Mr. Towns. I think it's a great statement, Mr. Chairman, and I hope you would consider it. Would the gentleman yield? Be delighted to yield to the chairman. Uh, committee staff has informed me that uh, this committee did vote on the uh, holding Janet Reno in contempt. In that case, it was for the actions of Janet Reno. In this case, we are only looking for the documents. And I might say to my colleague and friend from New York, where are all the documents? Okay. Okay. I, I yield back to the gentleman from New York. 
Well, I would ask unanimous consent the gentleman have an additional 30 seconds to yield to the gentlelady from New York without objection so ordered. Even Newt Gingrich wouldn't hold a contempt vote on the floor of the United States Congress against Janet Reno. So, I thank the gentlelady. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a sad day. Um, as it has been talked about a number of times here on committee, uh, we have uh, guns that uh, went to Mexico. Uh, at the same time, you had the Mexican officials um, so concerned about all of the weapons that were going to Mexico. Uh, and then we end up with a Border Patrol agent that was shot and killed by guns from the United States going to Mexico. Uh, and it is the duty of this committee to get to the bottom of this. And it is clear. And it, you know, people who, are, who might be watching this, uh, this hearing, uh, it is clear that um, there are those that do not want to get to the bottom of this and get the answers, that people would rather um, use legal ease to try to avoid turning over the documents that will help bring closure to a family who lost a family member. And it is our responsibility on this committee to get this done. The other side is making an argument that uh, uh, in some letter talking about uh, getting to the bottom of this or, the, or about documents that's mutually satisfactory. Well, you can't come to that conclusion when the other side doesn't want to turn over the information. If they wanted to turn over the documents, they would have done that by now. This committee would be, this hearing would look a lot different. It would be about what do we do in the future. It would be about reform. But instead, we've got um, uh, the Justice Department that continues to withhold this information. And I, if I could, Mr. Chairman, I know that this is a very narrow scoped um, markup, but I'll, I want to point out that um, there are a lot of troubling signs in this case. Uh, we had the opportunity in uh, uh, Foreign Affairs on October 27, 2011, with Secretary Clinton. And just so everyone understands, under the Arms Export Control Act, the Justice Department is required to receive a written waiver from the State Department to account for their intent to cause arms to be exported uh, across our borders and into Mexico. I asked Secretary Clinton on that day, um, did the State Department, and I'm quoting, I asked, did the State Department issue the Justice Department a license or a written waiver in order to allow for the transfer of thousands of weapons across the U.S.-Mexico border? Secretary Clinton's response was, This, Congressman, this is the first time I have been asked this, and I can tell you, based on the record of any activity by the Bureau that would have been responsible, we see no evidence. But let me do, let me check. Um, Secretary Clinton points out that in her department, they weren't asked for a waiver, a written waiver. That is in violation of the law. So as this committee moves forward, and I, think that, I thank the Chairman for his patience, we need to make sure that we get to the bottom of this, that the, the State Department acknowledges uh, that they weren't asked for this waiver. We are just looking for the information. And here at the last hour, the President is trying to, if they were so willing to give the documents, you wouldn't at the last hour have a letter come from uh, the, uh, the administration claiming executive privilege or whatever it is that they are claiming. We owe it to, we owe it to the people of uh, this country to get to the bottom of this. We owe it to the family who has lost a loved one to get to the bottom of this. And, Mr. Chairman, uh, I am uh, I'm, I'm with you on this. And I will yield to the gentleman from Utah. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I simply want to make a point that um, a week before last in the House Judiciary Committee, 
uh, Chairman Issa, uh, uh, Representative uh, Gowdy and I uh, were there. I asked the Attorney General if he was willing to sit down, and he was so adamant that the, the senior level of, of Department of Justice people were not involved. I asked him, would you be willing to come sit with us? Allow Mr. Gowdy and I to come sit with you and share this information. Show us what you have. We'll show you what. And he said no. He said no. He said, I'm done doing this. I have given you every um, bit of information, and I have no intention of, of uh, further talking to you. Sadly, that's in part why we're here today. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, the assertion of executive privilege has taken this proceeding into a whole new realm. And while well, Congress has the constitutional right in this committee, uh, to whom that right is delegated, to require the production of records, uh, the administration similarly has a constitutional right to claim executive privilege and to refuse to produce those records. Now, when you have a conflict between the uh, legislative branch and the executive branch, those conflicts uh, generally will go to the courts to make the decision as to whether or not the administration's claim of executive privilege uh, should be upheld. It would seem to me that before this committee would take any action on the question of contempt, uh, we would first appropriately uh, have to apply to a court to order the production of the records. If then the records were not produced, it would seem that uh, the question of contempt would then be germane. So I just want to um, uh, ask uh, the chairman uh, that in, in the interest of, uh, of avoiding uh, a, an untimely uh, collision over an issue of contempt, if, uh, if the chairman is prepared to uh, seek a, a uh, court order for the production of the records uh, prior to uh, having this committee act on the issue of contempt. If the gentleman is asking, did we go to the court to request a subpoena? No. Would you, would you, under the, once the President has asserted executive privilege as he has, are, are you prepared to challenge that in court, or are you prepared to proceed nevertheless with a contempt citation uh, when that issue has not really been uh, resolved, whether or not he has to produce those records. If the gentleman would yield. Uh, as I announced earlier, we are currently concurrently evaluating and trying to get from the White House a, a log of, of, of the actual assertion. As you know, the attorney, Deputy Attorney General is, cannot assert executive privilege, only the President can do it. So a letter saying that the President has done it is not sufficient. To that extent, we are working right now both with House counsel and uh, attempting to work with the White House to get that. But to the gentleman's uh, an answer to his question that probably is most illustrative, Mr. Kucinich, I believe you voted to find the Harriet Myers and Bolton a contempt. The President had, President Bush had asserted uh, executive privilege. Uh, he then continued to assert executive privilege after it was voted successfully out of the House and it went to the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia. So there is a precedent. Uh, every member on that side of the aisle that was here probably voted for that contempt. But having said that, um, this is not about that vote. Uh, we are trying to evaluate uh, where the President might assert executive privilege, if he has asserted it, and, and we will take note of that. But since it hasn't been asserted before this committee, uh, only a letter arriving from the Deputy Attorney General, that's the reason we're going forward. I will announce, if the gentleman would continue yielding, it is our intent, if the President produces a privilege log of what is not to be produced because categories specifically were part of his deliberative process, it would be my intention to carve that out of contempt so as to send a clean contempt resolution to the floor. We can't do that 
based on an assertion by the Deputy Attorney General with no specificity, and in light of arguments that have been made, statements that have been made by the Attorney General and the President in the past, that they didn't communicate. But we certainly are working on that. And I think the gentleman's point is good. I don't want to repeat a situation in which, if you will, and I think the gentlelady had already said that, in which it arrives at the U.S. Attorney's Office and then is not pursued. That's not our intent. Our intent is to get the documents as appropriate. Well, the um, uh, I'd ask the gentleman to have an additional 30 seconds yeah, without the, objection. As has been uh, stated by uh, individuals on your side of the aisle, uh, you have waited eight, eight months, I think it is now. Uh, you've made your point as far as what the authority of the committee is. Uh, the question is uh, whether or not uh, you would be willing to uh, postpone any action on the contempt citation, give the White House the chance to produce the log that you're asking for, and then determine whether or not it would be uh, most appropriate either to apply to a, a court of, uh, of jurisdiction that would give you the chance to uh, challenge the White House's position or then proceed with the contempt. It just seems that uh, there's, uh, given all your patience, that it would be a shame to produce a kind of a uh, titanic contest here between the two branches of government if there's a way to uh, try to uh, uh, make one more effort to avoid it. I thank the gentleman, and I take note of his comments. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, the del deliberative efforts you've made, um, including all the hearings, the letter writing, uh, our bipartisan trip to Mexico City, where we met with Mexican law enforcement officials as well as U.S. officials on this issue. Uh, but there is a time that a deliberative body needs to continue our efforts for oversight as well as government reform. This is all that we are doing here. Mr. Chairman, this hearing gives me no excitement or joy, uh, but Brian Terry, a proud son of the State of Michigan, a district in that state I represent, a proud and dedicated Marine, a dedicated law enforcement officer, and son of a grieving family, deserves our fullest effort to know the truth and not what our Office of the Attorney General calls evolving truth. There is no certainty in evolving truth. The Attorney General has publicly stated that the Department of Justice is committed to working to accommodate the Committee's legitimate oversight needs. The problem with that position is the Attorney General believes he is the arbiter of the Committee's, quote, legitimate oversight needs. The Attorney General's position that the Department of Justice decides which documents we need and which ones we don't is contrary to the Constitution and a century of case law. The evolving truth has an eroding impact on our citizens' understanding of what the rule of law is, as well as the Constitution. Still, the Attorney General and his deputies have repeated that position time and time again in the last week. The Attorney General's last best offer was to produce a, quote, fair compilation of documents covered by the subpoena. You can probably guess who the Attorney General's proposed uh, would decide which documents make it into that, quote, fair comp comp uh, compilation. Evolving truth again, which is difficult to work with. Contrary to what the Attorney General seems to think, complying with the Committee's subpoena is not optional. The failure to produce documents pursuant to a Congressional subpoena is a violation of Federal law. Still, the Attorney General refuses to give the Committee even a list of documents he is withholding from us, let alone to give us access to all the documents covered by the subpoena. So it is fair to say that we don't know what we don't know. Again, I say this is the problem of evolving truth. On the other hand, the Committee has gone to great lengths to accommodate the Department's interests as an agency of the Executive Branch. The Committee has made a series of accommodations in an effort to avoid today's vote. Citizens in my district are wondering why we have been so gracious 
in the time length that we have pursued this fast and furious issue. We agreed to view documents in camera. We have accepted redacted documents. We have done voluntary interviews instead of depositions. And we have clarified and prioritized the scope of the subpoena, among other things. The Department has not even cited any legal authority as the basis for withholding documents covered by this subpoena, nor has it asserted any privilege over the documents. It seems we are out of options. The Attorney General has not produced one single document since today's vote was announced and has put an impossible compromise on the table that takes us out of the running with no efforts on our part that would be sound and solid. That's unprecedented. And I believe it reflects the low level of commitment the Attorney General has to cooperating with this committee, a separate and co-equal branch of government. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me today in voting in favor of the contempt resolution, unless and until something more positive and concrete is brought before us to deal with. This is not what we should have been forced into even considering today. This is not what I believe any member on this side of the dais wants to see this come to. But rather, this has been brought about by the actions, or should I say the inactions, of an Attorney General and his office in carrying on evolving truth. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield 30 seconds to my colleague from New York, Ms. Maloney. I thank the gentleman for yielding for a point of clarification. I, I want to make sure that the record reflects that the Attorney General and his offer last night was an effort to fully satisfy the committee's uh, last outstanding information request and, and not to end the investigation. And I ask unanimous consent to place in the record his comments that were made on this matter after that publicly. I, obje I object. The, ultimately, the uh, individuals that were in the meeting have asserted their view of what he said. Uh, if, the, if the Attorney General wants to give us a, in writing something, I will agree to put it in the record as soon as it arrives. Would, would the Reclaiming my time, if, if I might. Um, you know, this at one time had been a legitimate investigation, something that this committee should do and we have generally done in the past with consent of all the parties on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it's painful to sit here and watch it turn into a partisan political theater uh, and unnecessary that it, that it move in that direction. We made a promise to the Terry family that we were going to identify what went wrong and we were going to ensure that it didn't happen again. Uh, we've gone a long way, I think, in identifying what went wrong, and I think that that's uh, something that we can all be uh, proud of, or at least think that we did our job. Somebody mentioned earlier patience, the patience that the committee had uh, gone on this, but I do want to know that some 7,600 documents have been provided to the committee. They show that the gun walking began in the Phoenix Field Division of the ATF in 2006, and that senior officials in the Department of Justice didn't know that this tactic was used in Operation Fast and Furious until 2011. Now, there were four of these operations. Three of them happened under the previous administration. We asked that Attorney General McCasey be allowed to testify because apparently he was briefed on that matter. He was not allowed to testify that, that one by the by. Now, there are other people at the ATF acting authorities who were going to testify that this administration, the Attorney General and others above, had not been informed and he wasn't allowed to testify. Yet this committee then issued a subpoena and it wanted information that it was illegal for the Attorney General to share that would have compromised ongoing criminal prosecutions and investigations. They wanted information that was prohibited from disclosure by federal law, whether it was currently under seal by a federal judge. It wanted the production of grand jury documents and other federal law, uh, the things that were prohibited by, for the Attorney General to turn over. It wanted documents related to active and ongoing criminal investigations that would jeopardize those prosecutions. Uh, and it wanted detailed information related to confidential informants, highly sensitive information that would endanger the lives and the lives of their families. So that's the patience, I guess, that was referred to earlier, that people were seeking all those documents that never should have been produced. And it wasn't until last Friday night that the chairman finally recognized that this was unprecedented and contrary to the rule of law and withdrew those requirements. But then he came and moved the goalpost and had a whole new updated citation 
And, and now we look at what's left to fight over here. Apparently, we're left to fight about uh, an explanation of how the Department came to learn that its original denial that this gun walking had occurred was inaccurate, which it now has acknowledged, and why they later changed course and admitted their error. So there's nothing in this remaining set that have anything to do with how gun walking happened and how it's going to be reformed. That's what we promised the family, to find out how it happened, which we've done, and then we promised them reform, which we're not doing. And when we try to do that, we can recall during the hearings, there was an effort made to question witnesses about the failure of the current laws to combat gun trafficking, and the chairman cut those questions off, specifically told the agents not to answer those questions, said it was outside the scope of the hearing and that it wouldn't be considered valid testimony. Uh, and so it seems to me that we took reform off the table before we even got started. I think that's an injustice uh, to the committee's work, but more particularly to the family and to the American public on that. This is a narrow set of new uh, objects that this committee uh, is apparently after from the Attorney General. He has said that he will provide those documents that he can and that he will work with the committee on that. There is a duty in the Constitution to accommodate each other, the executive branch and the legislative branch. It seems to me that since the goalposts have been moved yet again, uh, since the chairman had been wrong in so many of the earlier matters that he sought and now agrees that he, that he cannot and should not get, that, that there could be an accommodation made to commit to good faith. That's all the Attorney General apparently asked for, was that the chairman commit to a good faith conclusion of these contempt hearings if he produced the documents and explanations that went on. I would just hope that we would get back to a little sense of what this committee is about, uh, accept that accommodation for now. You don't lose your chance to go after contempt if it doesn't work, and then pivot and have this committee do the rest of its job. We've done the oversight part. We know what happened. Let's do the reform part, make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yield Would the gentleman yield? You have four seconds. Go right ahead. I'd ask unanimous consent the gentleman have an additional 30 seconds. Would the gentleman yield? Pursuant to the statement that you referred to about uh, Attorney General Michael McCasey, it has now been retracted by from the testimony of Attorney General Eric Holder, where he claimed that his predecessor, then Attorney General McCasey, had been briefed about gun walking in Operation Wide Receiver. Now the Department is retracting that statement and claiming Holder inadvertently made the claim to the committee. Well, I reclaim my time. It would be wonderful if we prevented him, had him come in here as a witness and found out what the actual matters were, what the facts were. You know, we shouldn't be predetermining them. The idea of asking for the testimony in that case was to find out what it actually was. There's no reason why he shouldn't be allowed to testify and why Mr. Mailman shouldn't be allowed to testify about who knew what, when, and where. We're not afraid to have the information come out. We just want the people to testify. But now moving on and knowing what happened in this case, let's do the rest of the job. Let's get to reform. I appreciate the gentleman. I might note that Kenneth Melson testified for two days before this committee and uh, may well be back before the committee in the future. The gentleman from oh, Mr. McHenry, do you seek recognition? The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today because Attorney General Eric Holder has failed to meet his obligation pursuant to the subpoena issued to him by this committee. We promised that we would get to the bottom of this matter for Brian Terry's family and the American people in order to make sure this type of operation never occurs again, that we would find out the facts, the information, reform the system based on the information. Many Republicans and Democrats on this committee demanded to know the facts and answers about this case a year ago when all of this started. But what started as a pursuit of facts has now turned into a slow crawl of evidence, requests, and delay. We cannot look at the evidence if the Department of Justice refuses to turn over those facts. Internally, they have reviewed 80,000 documents. They have actually turned over to our committee 7,000. I have no doubt that if the Department of Justice subpoenaed documents from someone, they would not patiently wait seven months for those documents to be, uh, to be produced. No U.S. attorney would allow someone to review their own documents and tell DOJ what they think is relevant, or to do this. I'll just brief the attorney on what those documents might include rather than turn the documents over. No U.S. attorney would go for that deal. Yesterday, Attorney General uh, Holder admitted that he had additional documents consistent with our subpoena request, but instead of turning those documents over, he tried to use them as a bargaining chip to control this investigation. It begs the question. What is in those internal documents that the Department of Justice that is so self-incriminating that the DOJ will not release them? Why would they rather use them as a negotiating tool? 
Now, prior to today, we have not had a request for executive privilege. But now it has been asserted, apparently, that the President is requ requesting executive privilege. We assume that the Presidential executive privilege request only involves his communication deliberations. So prior to today, we weren't even aware that the President was engaged in the deliberations in response to the actions after the February 4th, what we requested. The reason we are even interested in these documents is the Department of Justice gave Congress a false statement February the 4th of 2011 about DOJ's knowledge of Fast and Furious. December the 10th, Brian Terry was killed with, with two of more than 2,000 guns allowed to walk into the hands of known or suspected criminals. February the 4th of 2011, Department of Justice sent a letter to Congress in which they stated that the allegation that ATF sanctioned or otherwise knowingly allowed the sale of assault weapons to straw purchasers who then transported them to Mexico is false. ATF makes every effort to interdict weapons that have been purchased illegally and prevent their transportation to Mexico. We now know that multiple people in the DOJ were involved in the drafting of this letter, and we know that their statement was false. March the 22nd of 2011, the President spoke to Univision, and he said there may be a situation here which serious mistakes were made. If that's the case, we will find out and we will hold someone accountable. May the 2nd of 2011, DOJ again stated to Congress, it remains our understanding that ATF's Operation Fast and Furious did not knowingly permit straw purchasers to take guns into Mexico, a very carefully worded statement to state something that we now know is false. So one month, DOJ said the accusations are false. The next month, the President, to a reporter, appeared to state that there may be a situation in which some serious mistakes were made. And then two months later, DOJ again tells Congress that they didn't permit those straw purchasers to move into Mexico. All to be flipped again in December of 2011 when the DOJ, the Deputy Attorney General Cole, acknowledged that the February 4th letter contained inaccuracies. Listen, we need to answer the following questions. Who authorized this action? Who was in charge of the oversight of the operation? Why were they allowed to continue, and who will be held responsible for misconduct? When the Department of Justice refuses to provide these answers, the House of Representatives is forced to collect them. This committee was united together to walk through the process with ATF. But now that it is with DOJ, this committee seems to be separating off and saying ATF was okay to investigate, but we shouldn't investigate inaccurate statements from DOJ. Why is this important? On a multiple level, truth and veracity is essential in government. But this is also important because the DOJ is currently in an investigation dealing with security leaks, and this same DOJ will release a report in some future day that we also have to trust is accurate. I urge my colleagues to move forward with the contempt. We need this information. We have to get this out, both for the Terry family and to get a full accounting of what has occurred and when it occurred and by whom, and so we can hold people to account. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, we in Congress, uh, and especially those of us who serve on this committee, can get pretty passionate about our responsibilities, and we take our duties seriously, which we should. Uh, when that passion increases to fervor, however, our interest in overseeing the Federal Government can sometimes get the better of us. We can become so focused on what we originally wanted that we can lose sight of the point of our inquiry, and we have all experienced, I'm sure, uh, how our staff can sometimes become overzealous in their attempts to help us do our jobs. When we take the time to investigate an allegation and we spend money examining this, the issue, naturally we want to see results. And we want to get to the, to the bottom of the problem. And of course, we often feel the need to show that we, we are not wasting our time or the taxpayers' resources. But the test of leadership is not about sticking to the plan, no matter how badly it goes wrong. It isn't about seeing something through, even though it's clearly a failure. Successful leaders reevaluate. They recognize when it's time to change course, when it's time to give up a plainly incorrect theory, when it's time to admit one was wrong. 
uh, I was encouraged when the major majority correctly sig significantly narrowed the scope of the documents they demanded of the Justice Department. It, it would have been illegal for the Department to produce wiretap applications, grand jury testimony, and information about confidential informants. However, when one starts out with the pres presumption of guilt of a cover-up, as the majority did when they began this investigation, it's extremely difficult to admit when one is proven wrong. And that's how this began, with the presumption of guilt on the part of the administration, and in particular, on the part of the Attorney General. Not because of any evidence of wrongdoing, not because of any facts that would warrant such an aggressive and partisan investigation, but because the majority came into this Congress accusing the, pre the President of being, and I quote, the most corrupt president in history. They majestically promised seven investi investigatory hearings a week. They predicted scandal after scandal after scandal would be uncovered and examined and confirmed. And one by one, the majority held hearings on these so-called scandals. And one by one, these so-called scandals turned out to be anything but that. Grants weren't politicized, waivers weren't granted inappropriately, regulations were not job killing, government employees were not creating deficits. The NLRB was not a rogue agency, and the administration really is for all of the above energy policy. But the one charge, the one allegation, the one so-called scandal that seemed to take hold, at least in the press, that is favorable to the majority was fast and furious, with sensational charges, reckless accusations, and by exploiting a tragedy, the majority tried to create the scandal they were looking for. They put all of their efforts into making the, the smoking gun that would once and for all prove the chairman's initial charge of a corrupt know the most corrupt president in our history. But in hearing after hearing, we have learned the opposite. We have learned that the operation began in the Bush administration and that Attorney General Holder ended it. We have learned that the Justice Department was not improperly withholding documents, but in fact were properly safeguarding our documents according to the law. And we have learned that instead of the wrongdoing of the, of the corruption, of the cover-up that the majority had promised to deliver, there was nothing of the sort on the part of the Attorney General. And so after being brought down this blind alley, we come to a decision point. Will the majority admit or even accept that they were wrong? And will they reevaluate? Will they truly lead this committee? And as I said, I was encouraged by the narrow scope of the documents being demanded, and that was a good first step towards bringing us out of this alley. And I urge this committee to continue the reevaluation of what clearly turned out to be, in fact, not a scandal and not a cover up. And I urge my colleagues to reject this citation. I thank the gentleman. Who else seeks recognition? The gentlelady from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, on behalf of this committee for your, your, real, your efforts to really do due diligence and to get us to the point where we're ensuring that officials are held accountable for the responsible, uh, for the irresponsible tactics used in this uh, very flawed um, operation, which resulted in the death of Brian Terry. Brian Terry has been dead over 500 days now, and still no one has been held accountable. So it is with disappointment and with gravity that this committee sits here and I sit here to hold someone accountable for what has happened. Uh, I'd like to just uh, read off of the website, the OGR website, and I quote, our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to the taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and to bring genuine reform 
to the federal bureaucracy. That is what we are charged to do as a committee. And very unfortunately, this administration, uh, this Department of Justice have failed to pro provide this committee with the information and with the documents that we need to be accountable to the American people. My district is thousands of miles away from where this occurred, and yet the people in my district ask over and over again, who is it responsible for this flawed operation? Who are you going to hold accountable for the death of Brian Terry as well as hundreds of Mexicans? We owe this answer to the American people. That is what this committee is charged to do. The Terry family sat in this very room and we pledged to them that we would hold someone accountable for the death of their son, their brother, their cousin. That is what this committee is charged to do and that is what we have a responsibility to do. Throughout this investigation, the Attorney General's actions have been reprehensible. He's been callous towards the victim's family, inaccurate in the information he's provided to Congress, and he's not taken responsibility for his role. He's dodged difficult questions. If he wanted to provide the requested documents, he would have done so already. We have given him time to do the right thing, and he has failed to do it. In addition to the Attorney General stonewalling this committee, we now have the President threatening to invoke executive privilege. Leaders must lead. They must take responsibility for the good and the bad. And that is what this committee is seeking to find. Who is responsible for the death of a Border Patrol agent? The lack of transparency with respect to a dead Border Patrol agent is sickening. And this morning's threat of asserting executive privilege to maintain the veil of secrecy is even more sickening. Our mission in this committee is to shed light on government activity so that the American people know what their government is doing. My concern, Mr. Chairman, is what is being withheld from us? Why is the Department of Justice stonewalling this investigation? We must, as a, a committee, and I personally want to know what is he hiding. Were there more guns that walked? Were there more Mexican gangs that were implicated? Were there more Border Patrol agents who were silenced or hurt or maybe even killed? We want to know answers. The American people deserve answers. And most importantly, the family of Brian Terry deserves those answers. I yield back my time. Gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a sad moment for this committee and for the Congress. Some might be forgiven for describing the proceedings today as akin to a kangaroo court. What are the elements of a kangaroo court? First of all, the verdict is decided in advance. And the facts and the process are modified to fit that verdict that's already been arrived at. Kangaroo court process involves the distortion of facts, the selective filtering out of facts, controlling testimony, controlling what is available to the court and making sure that verdict that is arrived at in advance is arrived at, softening up the intended defendant by name calling, by badgering, by insinuation, by character assassination, by name calling. All of that, one might say, has characterized this process. If this were a genuine attempt to make sure that the Terry family had closure, we would have an open investigation. We would make sure the previous administration's wide receiver program that was the antecedent of Fast and Furious was thoroughly examined here on a bipartisan basis. 
and that the previous Attorney General was called as a witness to answer simply the questions of what he knew and when he knew it. A conscious and deliberate effort has been made here to make sure such testimony is not ever heard. When you exclude legitimate avenues of inquiry, it is for a purpose, and it is for a purpose to make sure that verdict in advance is arrived at. Nowhere have we had a hearing on whether or not our gun laws are sufficient at the southern part of our border to address the overwhelming flow of weapons from the United States to Mexico. I went to Mexico, too. And, the, and when we asked on a bipartisan basis the Attorney General of Mexico, what is the one thing our country can do to help you? We were somewhat surprised by his answer. His answer was, reinstate the assault weapons ban. But if your intent is to make sure it is political and to make sure that substantively we don't ever talk about guns in that sense, then you, then you actually warn a witness who dares to go astray in response to a question in saying, an ATF witness, that we need tougher gun control enforcement. We need stronger uh, uh, consequences when those laws are violated. What we never had a hearing about, we are talking about ATF. ATF hasn't had a permanent director in six years. Why? Political obstruction in the other body because they don't want, they don't want tough gun enforcement. They want weak leadership. So, yes, we are brought to this moment to believe that this is all about really a rogue attorney general who is uncooperative with this branch of government and he needs to be reined in, and the ultimate penalty we have available besides impeachment, contempt, for the first time ever, needs to be meted out to a man who is otherwise seen, broadly, as an honorable man who has put himself into this job, who is fighting all kinds of things on our behalf, from voter suppression to, yes, the drug cartels in the South. And we are going to demean him. We are going to tarnish his reputation, because that is how we get to the President of the United States. And you could forgive the public for the contempt in which this body is held in poll after poll when we behave this way, when we could have behaved so much differently and gotten so much more done on a bipartisan basis. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I certainly appreciate the sentiments of my friend, the gentleman from Virginia, but as a former prosecutor, I assure you, uh, there is nothing kangaroo about the death of a border agent. And this is a very sad day. And I take this responsibility very, very seriously. And I think I take the conduct of this committee very seriously. I try to approach it as I would as a the former United States attorney in the position that I had, and I am looking at the facts. I think we know from the beginning of the facts that gun walking occurred, and we know that gun walking is a direct violation of the policies of ATF. We know that an agent was shot and killed and left to bleed out in a desert, shot with one of those guns that was part of that process. We know that ATF originally denied that this gun walking occurred, and it was only in the process of that we then began to see the efforts of certain of the agents, the whistleblowers, those who bring information to us because they are so concerned about the misinformation that is being given to the public and to us by those who are their superiors. And it came to Senator Grassley, no right-wing Republican crazy, who reached out to the Department of Justice and asked for communication and was denied the communication that he sought and only came to this committee so that he would have the ability to have the capacity to be able to ask for answers to the very legitimate questions that he was asking. I'm concerned because in the process, some of the other things that we found out is rather than 
thorough investigation into the conduct of what may have occurred first at the ATF, what we have seen is evidence of intimidation of those very witnesses. They spoke about it before us. I have information in my hand, just a newspaper article yesterday. Some of the documents that were being requested by this very committee are being denied a document by the Attorney General, and yet the former U.S. Attorney, who resigned uh, in uh, less than uh, under pressure, uh, is reported here to have leaked those, that document to a reporter, the purpose of which was to disparage the reputation of the very whistleblower. And so we have act, uh, activity within the Department of Justice, and instead, instead of real looking, we see intimidation of those that are trying to bring it to our attention. We see the individual who was the assistant United States Attorney, who was charged with the responsibility of doing an internal investigation, who when asked to testify invoked his fifth, or was instructed that he would invoke, his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in this process. And so there's a series of very legitimate questions to be asked. What we do know by the information that came forward is that there was knowledge of these tactics at the highest levels of the Department of Justice. And that there was a letter that was sent to the Department of Justice when a request was made about this information where the head of the criminal division is reportedly participating in the editing of that letter a letter of denial that gun walking occurred at all. So we know that this goes to the highest levels. Trust me when I say the head of the criminal division in the Department of Justice is at the highest levels. What did he know? When did he know? What we do know is in the period since then, we have had a reversal, a 180 degree reversal, in which that same Department of Justice now identifies that as fatally flawed. If it was fatally flawed, who knew what and when did they know it? These are very legitimate questions to be asking, to be asking in a time in which you see the testimony of the former acting director of ATF in which he himself says that he believes that what is happening is those officials who have been appointed are trying to lay this off on other people further on down the chain. It is our responsibility to ask this question. It is the responsibility to do it in a dispassionate fashion, but the facts are leading us to very legitimate inquiries in which there is no question about very much of what went on. The question is, under what circumstances did people approve it? And I know from my experience as a United States attorney the detailed information that would be contained in an affidavit of probable cause that has to be forwarded to the Department of Justice as a matter of policy so that they may be able to oversee it, not just for sufficiency but for conformity with policy, again, to the highest levels. Explicit detail of what is going on. We see this red herring which occurs on often occasions in which they are suggesting that somehow this happened in a former administration. Gun walking may have happened in a former administration, but prosecutions did not. And that is the essence of where there was discretion that was used to deny this very process. Yet instead, this administration sends an ATF, I mean, sends to the ATF a prosecutor to help them reopen this case and sends subtle messages that this process is endorsed. That is the essence of what we have to get to the bottom of. There is a great deal more here. I urge that my Colleagues, do not be afraid to continue to ask the important questions on behalf of the United States of America and on behalf of Agent Terry. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this, uh, this investigation and this, these hearings started uh, in response to the loss of Agent Brian Terry. And I think all of us continue to offer our condolences to his family and, and to all of his uh, colleagues in uniform who protect our borders in all of our agencies. And that really was the, the impetus for these investigations. And I certainly could have been one of the 31 Democrats who signed that letter to ask the Department of Justice and the White House to cooperate with, uh, with this investigation and be forthcoming with, with any evidence that helped us get to the truth. 
But unfortunately, over the course of these hearings and uh, this investigation, that, that focus, that seriousness of purpose regarding the loss of Agent Terry has, has been lost. It has now morphed into a, a more selective, a more partisan, a more media-seeking uh, process. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about now is in this last iteration of the contempt uh, citation, we claim, or at least the majority now claims, that we are seeking documents surrounding the false letter that has been referred to by uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania who just spoke and others who have spoken about this as well. Uh, this letter, uh, which went out in February of 2011, was false, and it denied the fact of gun walking. Uh, by the, uh, by the Phoenix Office of the ATF, actually initially by the Justice Department. Now, if we are going after that, those documents around the denial, the original denial that gun walking was going on, the investigators also came up with evidence that in drafting that false letter that went to Grassley, great reliance was, was made on the statements of the Phoenix office of the ATF. That's where the statements came from. The Phoenix office of the ATF said, we're not doing any gun walking. They gave that information for the Department, to the Department of Justice, and that letter went to Mr. Grassley. Now, you would think, you would think, if we were pursuing the truth, we might call the folks from the Phoenix office of the ATF before this committee and have them answer to why they gave that false information. Here's where the selective, uh, I would say, the willful decision to ignore where the facts lead. That's where they come in play. We have never asked uh, Ken Melson, the former head of the ATF, who was part of this decision, we have never asked him to come before this committee. And I think the reason is because uh, in his internal uh, testimony with investigators, he has already said that he never informed the Department of Justice seniors uh, to him regarding gun walking because he was unaware of it himself. Because the information that he would be providing if he was brought before this committee would be exonerating to the Attorney General. So we didn't bring him forward. We didn't want to hear the facts. We didn't want to hear the truth. It would, it would get in the way of, of going after Attorney General Holder, so we never asked him to come. So this is getting away from a search for the truth in, in, with respect to the death of Agent Terry. Similarly, we know from our investigation that there was a, a prior program called Wide Receiver where under the Bush administration, folks were gun-walking weapons into Mexico. But we don't want to know about that because that would get in the way of our investigation and our prosecution and our contempt proceeding against Eric Holder. If we brought Michael Mukasey, who was actually briefed on the gun-walking operation and who was in office when the gun-walking began, that would, that would deflect the incriminations against the current sitting Attorney General. So this, this whole process has been very selective, very partisan. It's been a real distortion of what the work of this committee should be. When we all started out, you had 31 Democrats asking, asking the White House and the, the Department of Justice to cooperate and bring forward the truth. But what we've seen is that after, long after that request was made, this has been made a, a political uh, issue. This has been really uh, put forward to disgrace the sitting Attorney General. Uh, it has been done in a way that has ignored the facts and, uh, and has really been a, a miscarriage of what this committee is supposed to be all about in finding the truth. Uh, it, I'm disappointed. I'm greatly disappointed about how this has gone, gone on. Uh, 
Yeah, there are remaining questions to be asked, but we're not asking the right people. We have refused to bring them before this committee. Michael Mukasey, the previous Attorney General, and the head of the ATF, where the false information came from, we are not asking them questions. We're putting blinders on. Would the gentleman yield? General will yield. Uh, you weren't in the room when we quoted uh, that the Attorney General has retracted his statement about the former Attorney General McCasey having actually been briefed. That's no longer uh, accurately asserted. Will the gentleman yield to me? I'll yield, yeah. You know, Mr. Chairman uh, brought that up earlier. So uh, staff went and found the actual letter dated June 18, 2012, uh, to Senator Grassley uh, from uh, Judith C. Applebaum, the Acting Assisting Attorney General. And what was apparently retracted was an assertion that uh, Attorney General McCasey had been briefed on Fast and Furious and a correction that, in fact, he had been briefed on one of the earlier programs, Hernandez. I uh, ask unanimous consent that the without objection letter the and the right. materials related to it. Without objection. Right. And just, and just, to clarify, just to Wait. clarify, the, the earlier program was also involving gun walking. So, so my, I, I stand by my statement. He was informed about the earlier program. It happened during the Bush administration. It happened under Michael Mukasey. But we don't want to ask him about what went on at that point, and we don't want to bring back uh, Ken Melson from the ATF, who actually led to the false information being supplied to Mr. Gra to Senator Grassley. That that's my point. I yield back. I appreciate it. We now recognize the gentleman. Does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Would you yield to me for thirty seconds? I'd be happy to yield. I thank you. We have conducted twenty-four interviews, including two days with the U.S. former U.S. Attorney Burke, and two days with Kenneth Melson. Those interviews are exhaustive. Both the majority and minority were represented there. So uh, additionally, we have interviewed virtually all of the people that were made available to us at the local level. Not every interview, 24 of them, are appropriate to have here at the interviewed from the dais. So I appreciate the gentleman's statement. But ultimately, if you have taken or will take the time to read those two-day interviews of those two and other individuals, you'll discover we left no stone unturned. Additionally, the 7,600 documents we've received, a big part of them are from wide receiver and are in the record. I thank the gentleman from Ohio for yielding yield back. I, I thank the chairman and, and for his good work on, on the committee and with this particular issue. It's been alleged that we've ignored the facts. How can you ignore the facts when you don't get the facts? That's what this is all about. It's been alleged by the other side that we've already reached a conclusion. How can you reach a conclusion when you can't get the information you need to make a conclusion or make a decision? I mean, that's what this is all about. And, and look, I, I'm not one who has called for the Attorney General's resignation. I just want to get the information. We just want the documents that were requested eight months ago. That's all we're after. And now today, we get an executive privilege uh, asserted by the White House. Now, my understanding of executive privilege, this is, this is communication between senior staff and the President himself. And yet, we had the Attorney General sit in front of the Judiciary Committee when Congressman Chaffetz questioned him and asked him specifically if he had communicated to the President about this issue. He said he had not. So now, something's got to give here. Either what the, what the Attorney General said wasn't the case, or if it was the case, the President did I mean, something's got to give. E either we now know that Fast and Furious wasn't just confined to the Department of Justice, but now goes to the White House, or if the Attorney General was telling us the truth when he answered Mr. Chaffetz's question, then we continue to get stonewalling, and we don't get to those facts that we need to make a decision and reach a conclusion. That's what's going on here. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate what you're doing. I think we're right on target with this. We just want the information so we have the facts, so we can make a decision and reach a conclusion on this important matter. And with that, I would be happy to yield to my colleague from Utah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to simply make a point to my colleagues that has been brought up here. If you actually go to page 16 of this uh, contempt citation and look through uh, I, certainly items number one, number two, number four, and number five, it is not specific to just Fast and Furious. For instance, um, it says on number four, all documents and communications referring or relating to instances prior to February 4, 2011, where the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives failed to inter interdict weapons that have been illegally purchased or transferred. Um, it, it, number five, the same thing. So I think we have asked for that. We have done this in a bipartisan way in interviewing staff, and I just wanted to make that point. Yield back. Mr. Chairman, yield back. 
The gentleman yields back. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand you want to know, uh, and it's, it's fair to ask these questions, but it's also fair to question motivations when we're doing something of historical precedence like this. Uh, you're curious, but your curiosity seems to end at the beginning, prior to the beginning of the Obama administration, um, which is curious to me. I mean, these are fair questions that should have been brought out before this committee. You know, let's have the former Attorney General here, the head of the ATF, and ask those questions. This isn't a small thing you're doing here where you may be angry and you want this stuff. This is something this country has never done. So it's fair to ask what happened prior to this. Who knew what under previous administrations? Um, was anyone else killed or injured? Uh, where are those guns now that took place in the previous administrations? And that doesn't bring back anyone, but at least lets us know that your reasons for doing this or to sort out what is truth and what we care about here. Second, a wide receiver in Fast and Furious, it can't be understated. Both operations were wildly misguided, and independent investigations must continue and have to. Uh, those responsible must be held accountable. But today's vote has nothing to do with those investigations. Agent Terry's tragic death demands justice and accountability. But this vote has nothing to do with that process. Worse yet, this committee's actions redefine hypocrisy. Because if, if in the end gun walking is about safety of agents and people who live on both sides of the border, well, it's about gun safety. And I'll meet you any time and talk about that. If we're concerned about our agents and people on both sides, let's remember a few salient facts. In Arizona today, you can buy as many AK-47s as you want not handguns or guns needed to go hunting or to protect your home or business. You can buy as many AK-47s as you want and pass them on to the cartels through straw purchases, as occurs thousands of times a year, putting agents and residents at risk. We know this. It's documented. The vast majority of the guns being used by the cartels come from the United States. The punishment for some such transactions, the straw purchasers, was described here by an agent as equivalent to a moving violation. So we have two types of gun walking, both of them horribly wrong and dangerous. About, I believe you said 2,000 occurred under these uh, fast and furious and wide receiver. It led to extraordinary tragedy that should never be repeated again. But let's just keep perspective. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of guns, AK-47s, which from today on, if you don't want this to be repeated, are happening now as we speak. In, in, in addition, in many states, there's a gun show loophole. People can buy as, any type of gun they want as many guns as they want without a background check, despite the fact that the vast majority of Americans and NRA members think that everybody should have a background check. So you can have dangerous people who have been adjudicated dangerously mentally ill, felons, terrorists, buy whatever they want, and, and including and especially people who will use those guns and make a hundred percent profit selling them through straw purchasers to the cartels. What's especially troubling is you all have fought attempts to end that process. If this is about Agent Terry, if this is about safety and defending their honor and preventing this from ever happening again, hundreds of thousands that have already taken place, hundreds of thousands that will continue to take place, putting all of those people at risk. You know, let's have some perspective here. And it's fair when we bring that up to recognize that. What's our motivation today? There can't be anything worse that they've done than this fast and furious and wide receiver. Uh, and, and we need to get to the bottom of it. I get that. But don't try to argue and make the point that you're out there to protect the agent's safety if the vast numbers 
are on the other side that are continuing to go on and we do nothing to do this. Someone mentioned we need the guts to do the right thing. Well, we need to, do the gu we need to have guts, and I hope we have it, to do the right thing. In Chicago, a young man on his way home from school a couple of years ago stepped in front of a bullet to protect his friend, a young man named Holt. He had more guts than we do. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, being the only member from Arizona on this committee, I find many of the comments, rationale, justifications against this citation distasteful and utterly disdainful to the citizens of this country and more particularly those of Arizona and particularly also those in northern Mexico who will be living with the consequences of these egregious DOJ actions from here forward. If it was my way, I hope that we would have had a vote on each of the facts and findings so that each one of us would have had to put down what we actually, instead of bantering, political bantering, would have actually had to vote on what we find as fact and figure like we see within a judicial system. Finding Attorney General Eric Holder, Jr. in contempt of Congress is long overdue but welcome news for the American people and especially for Arizonans. As I explained in my recent statement, Mr. Holder has shown his contempt for our constitutional rights, our border, Arizonans, and all Americans. We should now hold him in contempt of Congress. 115 members of Congress agree that Americans lack confidence in Mr. Holder and his department. The people of Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas, who deal with unsecure borders and violent Mexican cartels on a regular basis now must now also live in fear of these firearms. These citizens deserve for, deserve for contempt charges to begin because it is with contempt for their safety that this operation was carried out. What is perhaps most discouraging is that people whose job it is to protect and promote justice failed the American people so badly. We are dealing with the Department of Justice. The lawyers who work there took an oath to uphold the Constitution, yet from sending Congress a false letter to continued stonewalling, these lawyers have brought a great shame to their profession. I am convinced that holding the Attorney General in contempt is the only way to send a strong message to this administration and future ones that no one is above the law, including the nation's top law enforcement officer. I continue to believe that Attorney General Eric Holder brought this upon himself by refuting to cooperate with Congress, and I believe fully that contempt charges are the appropriate way to go forward. I support Chairman Issa and applaud his resolve in moving this process forward. We all deserve better. I, re I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I would announce to all members that it is the intent of the chair to take a recess upon conclusion of all uh, striking of the last word. Uh, with that, does anyone seek recognition? The gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think it is most unfortunate that the deliberations of this committee have reached such a partisan and rancorous level. I have always been told that where there is righteousness in the heart, that there is beauty in the character. I have also been led to believe that the Constitution requires the executive branch and Congress to accommodate the interests of the other to avoid unnecessary conflicts. The framers of our constitutional democracy expected, and I quote, that where conflicts in scope of authority arose between the coordinate branches, a spirit of dynamic compromise would promote resolution of the dispute in a manner most likely to result in efficient and effective functioning of our governmental system. Attorney General William French Smith who served under President Reagan observed, and I quote, the accommodation required is not simply an exchange of concessions or a test of political strength. It is an obligation of each branch to make principled effort to acknowledge and, if possible, to meet the legitimate needs of the other branch. Our committee has failed its constitutional duty to accommodate throughout this investigation. For more than a year, the committee has been holding the Attorney General to an impossible standard by demanding documents he is prohibited 
by law from producing, such as documents involving Federal wiretaps and grand jury materials. Additionally, the Committee has continuously demanded documents pertaining to ongoing criminal investigations and prosecutions, which the Department explained would endanger the lives of confidential informants and jeopardize active criminal cases. Former Assistant Attorney General Ted Olson explained that these documents have been steadfastly protected by Democratic and Republican administrations alike since the 19th century. Late last Friday night, the Chairman finally made his first step at accommodation by revising the contempt citation to drop these irresponsible demands. Then in this late hour, the Chairman shifted the focus of his demands to ask for documents that show whether the Department's initial inaccurate denials about gun walking were part of a broader effort by the Department to obstruct a congressional investigation. In contrast, during the course of the investigation, the Department of Justice has repeatedly made significant efforts to accommodate this committee's legitimate oversight interests. It has made 26 individuals available for interviews and hearings and provided the committee with thousands of documents. The Attorney General has testified before Congress regarding fast and furious a total of nine times. As the investigation progressed, Department leadership realized that their initial denials that gun walking occurred were based on faulty information that they received from ATF and the Phoenix U.S. Attorney's Office. At that point, the Department not only acknowledged the inaccuracies and withdrew the letter, but provided 1,300 pages of internal deliberative documents that showed how the initially inaccurate letter to Congress was drafted. Those documents clearly showed that the officials in the Department's headquarters had no intent to mislead Congress. Despite this evidence, the Chairman continues to accuse Department officials of obstructing the Committee's investigation and seeks additional internal deliberative documents as part of a fishing expedition to support this unsubstantiated allegation. These allegations have continued on and on without regard to what evidence or information is provided by the Justice Department. I hope that the American people will see this as a witch hunt, as political activity, and not the legitimate interest of getting to the truth. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjolais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing us here today and uh, for your diligence in pursuing this extremely important matter. Uh, I truly regret uh, that this has gotten to this point, but the actions of the Justice Department have left us with no other choice. This is far from political theater. This is a legitimate in investigation into an operation, the Fast and the Furious, that was so flawed that it flew right into the face of common sense. There are many people in this room on both sides of the aisle that would agree that one person, any person, within the chain of command in this federal bureaucracy should have stopped this gun walking operation that put the lives of law enforcement officials and innocent citizens in harm's way. And certainly, the Attorney General is not above the law. We were originally told that this flawed decision was made by local officials. It didn't take long that we learned that, in fact, there was a significant information known by officials in Washington about the conception and execution of this operation. And with the President's recent uh, executive privilege letter, it uh, appears that it may go into the White House. Uh, this is uh, what Attorney General Holder's team infers is part of the evolving truth. That, that's a troublesome comment. 
the Obama administration, the Justice Department, cannot continue to stonewall the committee any longer. The American people want answers. Agent Terry's family deserves answers. The gentlelady from New York mentioned earlier that uh, this is all occurring because it's an election year. I don't think uh, Agent Terry's family cares that it's an election year. I don't think the families of uh, over 200 slain Mexican citizens care that this is an election year. It's past time for the Attorney General to produce the documents. I made clear in a recent statement that we have given the Attorney General ample opportunity to come forth and present the facts surrounding fa Fast and Furious, yet the Department has refused to cooperate. Now, I'm a freshman in Congress, and when I came here, I didn't know that if you started, if you dropped a bill and wanted to get it passed, it had to be done during that 112th Congress. So if it's not done by the end of this year, it goes away and you start over. The same holds true for what we're trying to bring to light here. And I don't think that's lost on the Attorney General's office. It, it starts to feel like they're just trying to run out the clock. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that the contempt report before us is thorough and accurate. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the committee's efforts to hold the Justice Department accountable. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Well, sinks recognition. The gentleman of Vermont is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of things to begin with. Number one, uh, the Attorney General or any other uh, subject of a subpoena cannot uh, demand uh, to have an agreement in exchange for a legitimate request from the committee. So uh, I think many, all of us probably agree with you on that. There were two different versions of what was discussed or how that uh, meeting went. Uh, uh, Mr. Cummings has a different uh, understanding of it than uh, the gentleman yield very quickly. Yield. I have uh, today gotten um, the, from the Attorney General's office uh, notice that all he's referring to is uh, trying to have a good faith effort to resolve the subpoena and uh, contempt issue only. I yield back to John. Well, that, that would seem fair to me, but I certainly would respect the, the chairman for uh, standing up for committee prerogatives. Second, I agree with the chairman that we do owe it to the Terry family to get to the bottom of this. But the third point, this is the challenge that we always have in Congress. Everything that we do, when it ends up on a partisan vote, leaves the American public with the view that essentially it's a political deal going down in Washington once again. And the hope I would have as a member of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform who strongly believes in vigorous oversight, legitimate access that Congress should have to all the information it needs in order to make a determination about accountability and how it happened, is that we lay that foundation in this committee that would justify in the minds of most of us, including on both sides of the aisle, that contempt, a very major power, is appropriate at this time. And the two questions that uh, trouble me uh, to suggest that we haven't reached that foundation, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that elements of the investigation th that would include things that happened when Fast and Furious uh, uh, or, or Operation Wide Receiver was being started, uh, what happened during the Bush administration with the then Attorney General, with the then ATF uh, uh, head, it would seem to me very reasonable uh, in pursuit of a full investigation that we would want to have those folks in, ask them what happened, and get the complete picture. Allow us then to have that as part of our investigation. We're not doing that, at least to my satisfaction, and I think many on our side of the aisle. The second thing is that the initial uh, subpoena that has re been revised since Friday does demonstrate th that what I would say was a little overbroad approach to trying to get information out of the AG. I mean, when we started asking for things that the law clearly prohibits the Attorney General from turning over, grand jury transcripts, you know, for the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 6C says that can't be turned over, uh, wiretap information uh, that cannot by the U.S. Code be turned over. In the the subpoena was adjusted on Friday, but Friday is only a couple of days ago. So we're in a situation now where no matter how we vote on this, there are many of us who, while we strongly support oversight and strongly support the necessity of this committee having access to the information broadly that it needs, many of us feel the foundation for this contempt has not been laid because of my view, an in inadequate investigation that would go to when this 
process began. And then secondly, a somewhat very overbroad subpoena that was just restrained last Friday that was literally asking the AG to turn over uh, documents that legally he's not able to do. So that's where that's where I'm coming from. I mean, there's a lot of us on this side. I think would be gettable vo votes on on on, uh, on a contempt uh, against any public official who was uh, uh, illegitimately withholding information. Uh, I certainly would be, but we need that foundation in order for this to have, in my view, credibility among the public that it's just not the usual roadshow here in Washington with us saying one thing and you guys saying the other, and here we go again. So thank you. If the gentleman would yield. I yield. Uh, I might make note that nothing stops the administration from giving us, as they have, the, inform the deliberative information and other information from the previous administration. Uh, a large amount of those 7,600 documents are about wide receiver. So this administration, this Attorney General has Attorney General McCasey's and, and Gonzalez's records. They have the emails, they have the operational plans, and they've given a great many of them to us. And we take note that the genesis for uh, the failed Fast and Furious, uh, albeit smaller, albeit different, appeared to come from the same unit with the same bad ideas uh, early on. And I think there's no argument on either side. And, and in fact, I think if the Attorney General, uh, any of the previous Attorney Generals came in here, they would agree that, uh, that in several of these cases they poorly executed on what would otherwise be follow the guns. The reason that we have narrowed or moved the goalpost easier for the uh, Attorney General to get a, a field goal here is, in fact, that we have had discovery and we've limited it. On May 18th is when the, uh, the Speaker took the extraordinary measure of narrowing the request uh, in a letter to the Attorney General. I might note he also spoke to the President on that. Last Friday, what we did as a result of our becoming aware, the ranking member also becoming aware of the details inside seven wiretaps, is that we felt that from a standpoint of contempt, although we still need additional information about people in the chain, that it really didn't need to be included in contempt. So we've narrowed contempt. We have not narrowed our, our need to get this information. And I'm not trying to lecture anyone because I'm not a lawyer. But in fact, the vast majority of the material we have not gotten, we believe, we totally believe, is not protected because of some uh, compromising of ongoing criminal investigations. But of course, to know that, we would need a privilege log, which we have not received even an, uh, an offer of. Well, if, if I may. your time. You know, it, it, there has been some narrowing. And, uh, you know, you adjusted the subpoena after Friday, so the, that request for things that he couldn't give us was was determined it was was uh, was withdrawn and then I think it is reasonable if there's going to be withholding of information because of a claim of privilege to get a privilege log I, I agree with that but the sense I have right now is we may be able to resolve this if we just take a half step back because there's a little bit of disagreement between you and the ranking member as to how you heard what the Attorney General said uh, and if it was your version, I'd support you, by the way. Uh, but I, but I, I, I think that the, 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 the way that uh, Mr. Cummings heard it makes it sound like the Attorney General is just trying to see if we can make some progress. So if we get, I would support a privilege log. Uh, if he's turning over these other items, uh, then that would be progress for us. Uh, I don't know if the committee can have some discussions about us doing our work to bring in some of these people in the Bush administration where it would at least give many of us peace of mind that we're doing our full job. So do we really need to do this today? I mean, at some point we may need to, but I don't feel like we really need to do it today in order to be true to our mutual obligation to get to the bottom of it and not uh, take no for an answer when it comes to getting documents that we're entitled to have. I thank the gentleman. Uh, who else seeks re recognition? The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Department of Justice, Mr. Chairman, is not just another agency within the federal government. The Department of Justice is responsible for safeguarding the fundamental foundation of this republic, which is respect for the rule of law. The department is symbolized, Mr. Chairman, 
by nothing more than a blindfolded woman holding a set of scales and a sword. She doesn't care about political agendas. She doesn't care about whether her decisions help or hurt people's re-election bids. She doesn't care about race, gender, socioeconomic status, just the equal application of the law so all citizens can have confidence in the decisions that she makes. So it is against that backdrop, Mr. Chairman, that we look at the facts surrounding this investigation. Fast and Furious was fundamentally flawed in its conception, flawed in its execution, and flawed in its explanation afterward. And this is not, Mr. Chairman, as was initially the administration mantra, an Arizona investigation. Senior level officials within the Department of Justice in Washington knew about Fast and Furious well before Special Agent Brian Terry was murdered. Senior level DOJ officials were briefed. They discussed press conference opportunities. They discussed the unsealing of indictments. They traded emails about the status of the case. They approved wiretap applications, and most significantly, Mr. Chairman, they actively discussed the tactic of gun walking well in advance of Special Agent Brian Terry's murder and well in advance of a demonstrably false letter being written to a committee of Congress that was calculated to deceive and mislead. And here's the proof. Here, Mr. Chairman, is the proof that Department of Justice in Washington, not Arizona, in Washington, knew about the tactic of gun walking well before Brian Terry was murdered. So we have a fundamentally flawed federal investigation. We have a dead Border Patrol agent. We have hundreds of dead Mexican citizens, thousands of weapons with America's fingerprints on both sides of the border unaccounted for, and a demonstrably false letter being written to a committee of Congress, and yet we're being asked for more time. Please wait. Give it more time. It's been over a year, Mr. Chairman. If Congress has time to look into Major League Baseball, the BCS, and invite Stephen Colbert to come to a committee hearing, surely to goodness we have time to get answers on a fundamentally flawed, lethal investigation like Fast and Furious. And thus we have, Mr. Chairman. We embarked on an investigation to get answers to some pretty fundamental questions that I still cannot answer. When I'm asked back in South Carolina, who within Maine Justice approved this investigation? I can't give them an answer. When I'm asked who knew about gun walking and did nothing to stop it, I can give them this, but this is part of the answer because it's part of the documents. How did the demonstrably false letter get written on Department of Justice letterhead and delivered to a United States Senator? I can't tell you how that letter got drafted. Why was it withdrawn after 10 months? Why did it take 10 months to withdraw the letter? Why was the criminal chief, to my friend Pat Meehan's point, why was the criminal chief of the Department of Justice in Mexico advocating for gun walking on exactly the same day that this demonstrably false letter was delivered to a committee of Congress? Can anyone answer that question? Can you tell me why Lanny Brewer was in Mexico advocating for a tactic that we all acknowledge is flawed on the very same day the Department of Justice was denying the tactic to Senator Chuck Grassley? Not only does Congress have a right to ask these questions, we have a fundamental duty to ask these questions. Our fellow citizens, the ones we're supposed to work for, when they get a jury summons, do you think they have a choice on whether or not to comply? When they get a subpoena from a law enforcement agency, do you think our fellow citizens get to offer an extraordinary accommodation in lieu of providing the documents? Either Congress has the authority to send a subpoena and require full compliance, or what we have been doing for the past 12 months is a fool's errand. And we never should have discussed contempt of Congress. Either we have the right to the documents and we should get all of them, or we have no business here. And with respect to executive privilege, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to resist the temptation to contrast Senator Obama's position on executive privilege with President Obama's position on executive privilege, but I would just note the juxtaposition is stark. If he was not part of the drafting of the February 4th letter, if he did not know about Fast and Furious before Brian Terry was murdered, if he did not approve of the wiretap applications, then what in the world is he asserting executive privilege for? 
He's either part of it or he's not. If he's part of it, then, then, then we've had a series of witnesses that have misled this committee. And if he's not part of it, then he's got no business asserting executive privilege, and I would yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Yarmuth is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to continue along the road that my friend from Vermont started. I'm very concerned about the public perception about what we're proposing to do here today. We've seen throughout this discussion for the last almost two hours uh, a serious dispute or perceptual dispute over a lot of the information that the committee and only the committee has seen. We've talked about yesterday's meeting with the Attorney General. Again, a difference in perspective or perception between the Chairman and the Ranking Member. None of us was there, so we have no way of judging, and certainly the public doesn't have any way of judging exactly what the Attorney General was asking for and what he was willing to do. We've talked about the Melson testimony. Well, the Melson testi testimony, or lack of it in, in front of the public, uh, we think is a very important element of this entire issue. The fact that Mr. Melson testified before a closed interview, the transcript of which is not available to the public, again, allows those who don't agree with the Attorney General to selectively quote the transcript in support of their argument and allows us to selectively quote from the transcript to support the fact that we don't believe that any senior members of the administration were aware of many of these activities. The public has no way of judging that. My friend from South Carolina referenced the wiretap applications. I read through them yesterday, and I would say without, since we can't talk about what was in them, that my perception of what they would imply was far different than my friend from South Carolina's perception. The whole point being, that what the public is left with is nothing but a default position. Those who tend to be Republicans or oppose the administration are going to default in support of the contempt action. Those who support the president of the administration are going to tend to default to support in op or to opposition for the contempt citation, and those who are independent are going to just say, this is another partisan activity, a pox on both of you. Uh, the vote on the Myers and Bolton contempt citations on the floor was so partisan, I think there were three Republicans who voted against or for the contempt citation. Every other vote cast on the House floor was a partisan vote. So I'm very much concerned about the impact of this action that is proposed today on the perception of the public that everything in this body has to be partisan. And as my good friend from Vermont said, there are those of us who believe strongly in the oversight function, strongly in the separation of powers and the equality of uh, the Congress and the obligation of Congress to pursue these avenues of investigation. Uh, some of you remember in my first term I was on the Oversight Committee and I wore a button call that said Article One because I strongly supportive of the prerogatives of this, this institution. Uh, but I'm afraid, again, as, as my friend from Vermont said, without the background that the public needs to have to determine whether we are acting in anything other than a partisan fashion, um, I think we are falling short. So uh, I hate to be put in the position of voting for a contempt citation when much of the information, like the discussion yesterday afternoon with the Attorney General is beyond uh, my uh, possession. Uh, I, I would say that this, this activity, this endeavor is something that, again, is only going to enhance partisanship in the country. I would be forced to oppose it when I am, I think, equally committed to making sure that this body has all the information it needs to carry out its constitutional responsibilities. Are you Will the gentleman, gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yes, sir. Yield? Uh, briefly, the wiretaps and all of the testimony of people like Kenneth Melson and others are, include very sensitive information. I understand. Under speech and debate, every one of those documents is available to you. You may selectively 
essentially use it uh, as you see fit. So I, I would hope the American people would understand that there are a plethora of Republicans and Democrats able to take that source material and sparingly but appropriately glean from it. It is one of the great challenges, is that that which comes to us for which we should not make public, we still have to act on and vote on. And uh, I share with the gentleman that this is one of the difficulties. The former ATF director talked for two days about some very sensitive information, much of which the public will be happy not to have made public. Uh, but it, those who want to go through his testimony will also find arguments on both sides that uh, the committee would appropriately uh, see made public. Uh, and I want to thank the members, and I know we are nearing the end of our uh, time here, uh, for at least the fact that this committee has kept secret everything that should be kept secret. There have been no leaks of sensitive information from this committee, and many of you have read the most sensitive information. So often we don't thank ourselves or other members when we do the right thing. And this investigation, for all of its lack of, uh, of agreement, we have agreed to keep sensitive the information law enforcement has provided with us directly or indirectly. And I thank the gentleman yield back. Thank you. If I have any time remaining, I yield to the I would ask the gentleman have an additional 30 seconds. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I yield that to um, Ms. Norton. I, I thank the gentleman and the chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to clear up the, uh, the, the, the notion that has been raised that uh, the President uh, could not invoke executive privilege. Uh, since it was said that there had been no communication with the, pre with the President under uh, Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, the executive has often invoked executive privilege with respect to pre-decisional deliberative communications. And I thank the gentleman for you. I thank the gentlelady. And I yield back. Thank you. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Accountability. It's what the American people expect. It's what the American people crave. And in return for accountability, the American people give forgiveness because they understand that everyone makes mistakes, that everyone has errors. Accountability. It's one of the keystones of our system of checks and balances. It's a fundamental principle of the jurisdiction of this committee to hold accountable all levels of the federal government for the actions that they take. And yet today we are here because we have an Attorney General who has failed to be accountable for the actions that his department has taken that has resulted in the death of not only a Border Patrol agent, but countless others in Mexico. And so to the family of Brian Terry, I wish to say on behalf of the American people, I truly apologize for what has happened to your son and to your family and for what you've had to endure as a result of this. And I further apologize that we have an Attorney General who has failed to take responsibility, who has failed to find anybody accountable for this. And I have said it before, and I will say it again, that you may be able to delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. And today we are here because we have an obligation to find out who is accountable, who is responsible for these actions that could have been avoided. And yes, we see the red herrings that, oh, well, there was wide receiver, and it's an operation that happened under the Bush administration, an operation that is totally different than Fast and Furious, an operation that was, that, that, that was started and yet stopped once it was found out by President Bush. It resulted in no deaths, and more importantly, it did have the knowledge of the Mexican government. But yet, when we send a subpoena to this administration, including with it not only the documents that we see and seek under Fast and Furious, we also seek the documents from wide receiver. And why is it that we receive a plethora of information regarding Fast and Furious under the previous administration and just a smidgen of documents regarding the, the, the Fast and Furious? Is it because this administration continues to want to blame continues to want to hold responsible the previous administration for this current administration's irresponsible behavior, abject failure in policy, when are we going to stop the blame and look for accountability? I will tell you, Mr. Chairman, that accountability starts here with this resolution. I will tell you that the American public are tired of the evolving truth that is 
trickling from the Department of Justice and demand the actual truth which this resolution will bring. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield the balance of my time to my good friend from South Carolina, Mr. Gatti. Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, simply say this. There's been a lot of discussion this morning about wide receiver, about previous administrations. Mr. Chairman, let me be very clear. Bring them all. Bring everybody before this committee. Anyone who has information about gun walking, bring the information before the committee because gun walking is wrong no matter what administration does it. So bring the Republicans and bring the Democrats and bring the Bull Moose Party and bring the Whigs. Bring them all. But that does not mitigate this Attorney General's responsibility to comply with a subpoena from Congress. Those are two separate issues, Mr. Chairman. What happened? Let's get all the information to all of our colleagues who want to blame the Bush administration for everything that has gone wrong in this country. Give them their day. But that does not mitigate this Attorney General's responsibility to comply with the law. And I'll say this in conclusion, Mr. Chairman. Like my friend Pat Meehan from Pennsylvania, as a former prosecutor, this is a sad day. For someone who worked for the Department of Justice, I hasten to add, in a Democrat administration, this is a sad day. But it is a necessary day. The notion that you can withhold information and documents from Congress, no matter whether you're the party in power or not in power, is wrong. Respect for the rule of law must mean something irrespective of the vicissitudes of political cycles. I thank my gentleman, from, uh, my friend from Florida, and I yield back. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentlelady from California is recognized, Ms. Spear. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I want to apologize to the American people for yet another show of gotcha politics in this body. I would associate my comments with Mr. Gowdy because I too am deeply concerned with gun walking and the fact that this activity went on under both administrations. The fact that the ATF thought that it had the power to make that decision without running it up the flagpole to the highest officer of law enforcement in this country. There needs to be an entire investigation of how the ATF operates in this government under any administration. They are cowboys who think that they can just do what they do without getting prior approval. I f am frightened to think what would be going on today had Agent Brian Terry not been murdered? Would we even know about Fast and Furious or Wide Receiver? That is the seminal question that we should be asking ourselves. How things can go on in any department in this government of the nature that Fast and Furious and Wide Receiver were, as outrageous as that was, and not have it known at the highest levels of government. And I would also associate myself with the comments by Mr. Quigley. For all the chest pounding going on in this room today, gun walking is going on right now. We are continuing to aid and abet the cartels in Mexico because we don't have the guts to do anything about the loopholes that exist in terms of gun ownership. No one needs an AK-47 in this country, and yet you can get them anywhere you want, with the exception of California. That's what's wrong. Will the gentlewoman yield? I will. If, if you are so insistent, I'm sorry, right here. <laughs> if you are, thank you for yielding. If you're so insistent in making sure that this never ever happens again, don't you want to see the documents? To your comment, we have received 7,000 documents. We have the AG 
more than willing to negotiate with us for the documents, frankly, that have nothing to do with the actual activities of ATF and how it got started and how it operates. We're talking about documents, internal documents between staff members within the Justice Department after a letter was sent on February 4th that was erroneous to the end of the year when it was recalled by the administration. There's no cover-up here. There's no 20 minutes of a tape that's been wiped out. If the gentleman because, would yield. No, I, I've already yielded. I'm trying to respond to your question. If, if what we're talking about is the, the process, the internal process of how a decision was made to recall that letter and to say, no, we were wrong, fine. But that has nothing to do with the fact that Agent Terry was killed under a program that existed in this country where the highest levels of government didn't know what was going on. And we've got a, a rogue operation in ATF. That's what we should be discussing. But if the gentleman would yield, that's what I'm trying to find out. That's what I think you're trying to find out. But how can you come to a conclusion if you haven't seen the documents? That's all we're asking for. No, the documents that we're requesting are the documents that relate to a letter that was developed by the Legislative Affairs Department within the Justice Department that was sent and was erroneous. I, if the gentleman would yield. No, I'm not yielding any longer. I have 52 seconds, and I want to yield the rest of my time to the ranking member. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Um, let me say this. The, in, uh, the Attorney General yesterday, and uh, he agreed to provide documents uh, after the subsequent to February 4th documents. Those documents uh, would go to the, I guess, allegations that there may have been some retaliation against the whistleblowers. Uh, keep in mind, too, that the, the um, privilege that was asserted this morning by the President, it does not even include that. They're saying that uh, we look at, you can ha have those documents you want. Um, second, you also agreed to provide a substantive briefing on the dep all the Department's actions with regard to the issues you just raised. Third, you also agreed to request a request by Senator Grassley for description of the categories of documents produced and withheld. And, the, and part of the problem there was to do these privileged logs, you've got to go through each document and then tell what the document is and why you're withholding it or whatever. And, and fourth, he agreed to entertain any kind of substantive questions and follow-up. Um, I think that he made a reasonable offer. He made it, and by the way, and uh, just the last thing, in that discussion, he, he constantly said, that there are certain traditions that things that go with the office. In other words, certain things he wanted to protect with regard to the office. Not him, the office as it has been in existence over the years. And he said he wanted to continue that, and he offered to work with the, uh, the uh, chairman. I don't think that for one minute he's trying to hide anything. I've, I've, I have not gotten that impression. I think he wants to work with us. I think he will work with us. And I think we're just going to have to, I would love to see us uh, work with him and get these documents when we can get them. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. Does anyone want to seek recognition? The gentleman from New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was clear to me after the meeting with uh, the majority and the minority members of this committee, as well as the Senate committee and the Attorney General yesterday and his team, that he placed very specific conditions uh, on this committee and this chairman regarding information he would provide and briefings he would provide in exchange for uh, the conclusion of this inquiry. And that is not acceptable for one simple reason. Only 7,600 documents have been released. That is less than 10 percent of the documents that exist relative to this inquiry. This inquiry is very simple. It is about releasing documents that are directly pertaining to who knew about this uh, operation, who was engaged within the Justice Department in this operation? And based on today's developments of the President uh, seeking uh, executive privilege, it does call into question when the White House was engaged in this. Um, I've had the opportunity 
uh, as recently as Monday to review uh, the wiretap applications for Operation Fast and Furious. And I, Mr. Chairman, was personally surprised by the volume and level of detail of the information regarding the questionable investigative tactics that senior department officials were presented with through these applications. And to me, it's unacceptable that senior department officials did not halt this operation immediately upon learning of these tactics. And that is very clearly stated. Uh, I support uh, the ongoing pursuit of the documents responsive to this committee's subpoena. I think they are uh, necessary in order for every one of the members of this committee uh, to identify the answers uh, for bipartisan questions that have been uh, asked through the course of the last year. And I think that the American people also have the right to know the complete and total truth about this operation. And it's our obligation as members uh, to seek and identify that information on behalf of the people we represent. And certainly the people of New Hampshire have asked me about the engagement and involvement. And I hope that we can continue this in not a political fashion, but in a fashion where we obtain facts. And that, to me, is the crux of this subpoena request, to specifically identify facts that directly pertain to this inquiry. And when you look at the fact that there is a minimum of 80,000, as many as 140,000 documents, and only 7,600 have been released, many of which don't even pertain to Fast and Furious, it does beg the question, what is not being provided or released to this committee? And it does beg the question, why, since February of 2011, there have been very limited information provided to this committee. And that is why I would continue to support uh, the ongoing effort to obtain these documents. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yield back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Labrador. We actually come to this day with some regret. Um, we have had a year and a half of of hearings, of requests from this administration, and we have had uh, the this, this sadness of what happened to the Bryant Terry family that has been enveloping every single proceeding that, that we have been a part of. Um, I want to get to the bottom of what happened to Bryant Terry. I want to get to the bottom of what happened to other people who have been damaged by, by the actions of our government. And the key question has always been, what did this administration know and when did they know it? We have been asking this question for close to a year and a half now on this, on this matter. And I have a request for you, Mr. Chairman, and if you could just answer some questions. Please. Of course. Um, the other side continues to talk about yesterday's proceedings. And they continue to say that there was a very reasonable request made of you the under, my understanding of the request is that you were supposed to completely agree to not hold these proceedings in the future if, you, if you, they were going to give you those documents. Is that correct? That is correct. I think both the ranking member would agree that contempt had to be off the table in return for documents that we had, were not presented yesterday nor described. So the reasonable request was that these proceedings were not going to be off the table completely, not delayed but completely off the table. Is that that's correct? That is correct. Okay. I don't find that reasonable, and I don't think the American people will find that reasonable. And that is why we are here today. If the Attorney General of the United States would have come to the meeting yesterday and would have said, you know what, we are going to give you those documents, and then we can discuss the contempt proceedings, I think that would have been a reasonable request. If he would have said, you can hold your contempt proceedings later, but let me try to comply with this subpoena, I think that would have been reasonable. But instead, we have been sitting here, and as I said back in October, the Attorney General of the United States has an obligation to provide truthful and accurate testimony to Congress. When Attorney General Eric Holder testified before Congress on May 3rd, his statements were either untrue or deliberately misleading. It is clear from recently released documents that Mr. Holder did in fact know about Fast and Furious well before he publicly admitted. Attorney General Holder has a troubling pattern of failed cooperation with the legislative branch. 
Because of this intentional stonewalling and his misleading testimony, I now call for Mr. Holder's resignation. I have said that from the beginning, and this pattern continues even till this morning. The Attorney General has not only failed to produce all the relevant documents, he has misled this committee and misled other committees, preventing us from uncovering the simple truth of what happened. When did they know about it? What did they know? And when did they know it? When the Attorney General was before this committee last year, I brought to light his historical pattern of willful ignorance with a series of slides highlighting his lack of knowledge when he's under oath. He knows nothing, he says nothing, and he seeks for nothing. Never in my life have I been met by a man more unconcerned with the search for the truth. My slides, as you remember, struck a nerve with Mr. Holder, and he protested, but with the look of a man who knew he had been found out. And since then, we found even more instances of Mr. Holder being ignorant about key facts. For instance, Mr. Holder used his trademark phrase, I am not at this point aware that gun walking tactics were, were contained in wiretap applications. Now, after having received the wiretap applications that Mr. Holder has desperately tried to keep from this committee, we do know that those tactics were explicitly outlined. Contrary to Mr. Holder's testimony, once again, the facts are clear. Mr. Holder is either not telling the truth or he's grossly incompetent. I repeat my call for his resignation. I support the proceedings today, and I support what this committee is doing. So, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have been here now for almost uh, three hours discussing this matter, and I think that indicates that members on both sides of the aisle of this committee feel like it's important. Uh, one of the reasons I'm on this committee is I'm passionate about getting to the truth of matters. I'm on this committee because I think it's important that the American people know what's going on. I think my time, rather than piling on to some of the things that have already been said, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to address some of the things that have come from uh, the other side. And they say, well, why don't you wait a little bit longer? Why don't you put up? You know, Folks from the other side of the aisle are real quick to say, we're do-nothing Congress. But then when we're trying to do something, they say, no, wait, slow down. And I, I just find that to be wrong. You know, we, we've been working on fast and furious investigation for a year now. This subpoena has been in place uh, for the better part uh, of a year. And the uh, Attorney General has had every opportunity in the world to voice his objections and comply. But instead, we wait until the last hour and say, well, give us some more time, or you bring out something like executive privilege. Now, you know, it's been 30 years since I'm in law school, but my understanding and recollection from law school, and has been um, verified by some of the other folks speaking here today, executive privilege is rightfully very narrow. It's there to protect the inner debates within the White House, give people the freedom to speak freely to the President without fear of reprisal. But if we take executive privilege down to internal discussions within every government agency, we might as well pack this committee up and go home because there's nothing to be investigating. We need to be looking into what the government decision-making process is within some of these agencies so we can develop laws and policies to ensure that it's better. You know, I'm concerned that this is being turned into a partisan issue uh, as well. And I would like to invite my colleagues on the other side of the aisle or anyone on this side of, uh, on this side of the aisle who's thinking we're not going to vote for this contempt citation to remember the righteous indignation that you felt when Agent Terry's family was up here. When we were first hearing about this uh, over a year ago, there was bipartisan uh, disgust at what was going on. But now, in order to protect, I think, a political appointee, we're circling the wagons and drawing this uh, uh, along party lines. And, and that's not right. Remember the promises that were made in this room to Terry's family. We would not rest until we got to the bottom of this. Well, we may not be resting, but we sure are taking uh, our good time about it. You also hear from the other side of the aisle, well, Ray, maybe we should be here, have hearings about strengthening and tightening gun control laws. I, I think that's a red herring and a non sequitur. 
back in Corpus Christi, Texas, we just got a new police chief, Floyd Simpson. One of the first things he did when he came in, he saw an increase in traffic crime. So he, in, he came and started saying, all right, officers, you're going to go out and you're going to write more speeding tickets. Not a lot of people like that, but it was the right solution to the problem. He didn't go to the city council. He didn't go to the Texas legislature saying we need to increase the penalty for speeding. He enforced the laws that were on the books and solved that problem. So I think that it's a red herring there. You know, this committee has a constitutionally mandated duty to conduct oversight and uh, to inform the legislative function. Uh, we must take action in uh, response to the Justice Department's failure to cooperate in our investigation in Fast and Furious. Taxpayers who footed the bill for this operation have a right to know what went on. The families of the fallen have a right to know. And we need the deliberative letters. We need the information after this investigation started. Because if you look at the history of investigations in this government, all the way back to the Nixon administration, it's not the crime that gets you so much, it's the cover-up. The American people are willing to forgive a mistake if somebody comes up and says, yes, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it again. But when the cover-up starts, the American people do not tolerate being lied to. They do not tolerate their elected officials being lied to. And they do not appreciate not knowing and not having a transparent government. This culture of stonewalling has got to stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Who else seeks recognition? The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, is recognized for five minutes. And I thank the chairman. And I, uh, I really... Uh, I know you're being complimented for your patients. I, I really give more compliments to the people of the United States for their patients. Uh, we've been going at this now for quite some time, and you know the question that comes up to me is why? Why are these documents not being given to us? And if they're truly that harmful, I mean, there can't be any harm when it comes to our border agents. I mean, uh, Agent Terry is dead. Uh, there's hundreds of uh, Mexicans dead. So people say, well, it's too sensitive, and we can't let that out there. There's something wrong here. There's just something that, that is just basically wrong and something that doesn't, doesn't have the, the right feel to it. And when you keep getting stonewalled, as uh, Mr. Fahrenheit just said, why? What is it about these documents that are so sensitive? And is this a political charge? It's absolutely political, especially if you're running for re-election. This is totally political, and the fact that if it was not political, why would we not be getting these documents? This has nothing to do with Attorney General Holder as a person. It has to do with his performance as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the United States. In a nation that believes that we are a, a nation of laws, and that nobody is truly above the law, that includes, by the way, all of us, the Attorney General and the President of the United States. Then the question comes, well, then if you can find a way to use the law to hide behind something, why would you do that? Now, I don't speak as a lawyer or a constitutional uh, a pr pr uh, expert. The common sense of what is wrong here is what comes to light all the time when I sit in these hearings. There is something basically flawed when the Department of Justice can't give you the answers, when the Attorney General can't give you the answers, when, when you hear that we have a, 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 an evolving truth. What in the world does that mean? Uh, when the... Attorney General inadvertently made claims to a committee that uh, then Attorney General Michael McCasey had been briefed about gun walking in Operation Wide Receiver. This is a, a memorandum, by the way, from Senator Grassley's office. And I, if it's not in, in the testimony, I'd like to be uh, entered unless there's some objection. Um, in addition, this is from the Without objection, so ordered. In addition, the Justice Department's release released only one page of additional material prior to Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General's meeting on Capitol Hill on Tuesday. It is a page of handwritten notes by a public affairs specialist for the, de the Deputy Attorney General, which the Department says it just recently discovered. The notes indicate that when Deputy Attorney General Jason Weinstein met with senior ATF officials on April 28, 2010, Regarding the problem of gun walking and wide receiver, the Deputy Attorney General's public affairs specialist also attended the meeting. The notes indicate that Fast and Furious was also a topic discussed at the meeting in addition to wide receiver. These notes further corroborate contemporaneous e emails in 2010 that show Criminal Division Chief Lanny Brewer and Weinstein seemed to have more concern about the press implications of gun walking than they were about making sure the ATF ended the practice. The notes also undermine the claim that senior DOJ officials failed to make the connection between gun walking and wide receiver, which Brewer admitted to knowing about 
and gun walking in Fast and Furious. I just find it a little bit suspicious that we know everything about wide receiver. We get countless documents about wide receiver. When you ask for documents about Fast and Furious, you know what? We can't give those to you. Is it political? Absolutely it's political. The American people are fed up. They have lost trust and confidence. When what they ask for can't be provided in a timely fashion, if you did this in the private, private sector, you would be held in contempt of court. You don't, I don't have the option as a citizen to walk away from these obligations. But the highest ranking law officer in the United States does? No, 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 not here, not in this country, not at this time. Now, why we have to come to this is because we were forced to come to this. If the Attorney General didn't want to have to go through this, just give us the documents. What could be so damning in those documents that they can't be given to us? Everything from wide receiver can, but everything from fast and furious cannot. Is it political? Absolutely it's political. And I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Seeing none, the question would occur on the, uh, the uh, uh, resolution before us. However, I know a quorum is not present. Therefore, I announce a recess. The recess will conclude and we will re reconvene with the anticipation of votes 10 minutes after the last vote on the floor, which is expected to start at 1.30. And finally, so we not quit on a low note, I might note that during the recess, the clerk should observe her birthday, which I understand is today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We stand in recess.